So um, then we move on to a, a very important item. It's not to say that everything we're going to hear tonight is not important, but um, Madam Cook, would you please introduce item 6A? Yes, um, recommendation to review, comment, and provide direction on the city's general plan 2021 to 2031 housing element update process and schedule and authorize staff to request updated guidance from the state of California regarding compliance with the applicable housing law. And we're promoting Andrew Thomas, planning building transportation director, and I think he has a presentation. He does, and while Andrew's connecting his audio and his video, I, and we have um, from the city attorney's office, Selena Chen. And we have a special guest who's gonna be here to answer your technical questions on this subject. And that is Mr. Paul McDougall from the State Department of Housing, Community, uh, Housing and Community Development, HCD. So I, as you may um, all realize right now in our state with all these cities uh, and counties of, of throughout the state updating their general plans and their housing elements. Mr. McDougall is a very busy person, but he graciously agreed to come and help um, lend his technical expertise to answer our questions. So we are a very grateful welcome and thank you. And welcome Andrew Thomas, our planning, building and transportation director. And I turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Ashcraft, members of the council. Can you hear me? Yes, right. it's perfect, Andrew. Right. Wonderful. Um, uh, I am pleased to be here tonight um, to present our housing element update public process and schedule. Um, this is an important opportunity for us to really show our plan for the next 18 months. Uh, to you, the city council, we gave a similar presentation to the planning board and to the public uh, last week. Um, and it's an opportunity for the city council and the public to ask questions, make comments, give us ideas on how to improve the process and the schedule. It's, it is going to be a major effort for the city of Alameda over the next two years, 18 months, but it really is a team effort. It's gonna require a lot of work by city staff, but it's also, there's a very important role for the planning board to play in this process. The city council plays an absolutely central role and is a key player on this team. And then of course, our, there's our community um, that has to be sort of understand what we're doing and um, participate throughout this next 18 months. So it's important for us to just sort of um, make sure that everybody understands the game plan. And as, as you said, uh, Mayor Ashcraft, we're really lucky to have Mr. Paul McDougall from uh, State um, Department of Housing and Community Development. Paul has helped the city of Alameda um, in 2012 when we um, had our, when we end in 2014. So our last two housing elements were certified by the state of California. Um, and it happened in a large part due to help and assistance and just great advice from, from Paul McDougall. So thank you, Paul, for joining three, us tonight. Three, Andrew, we, we weren't as successful on the first one. <laughs> All right, let's we, keep moving. Next, we uh, just keep getting better. Mr. We are getting, <laughs> we are getting better and better. Um, let's go to uh, who's in charge of the slides. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna. Um, so the game plan for tonight. I'm gonna rush through about seven slides and try to do it in ten minutes, and then. Um, I, I'm available to answer questions. Paul will help me answer. Um, if you have questions for Paul, just call him out and we will um, we'll get your questions answered. Um, so first of all, just so that everybody is on the same page, um, what is a housing element um, for the benefit of the public? I know the council knows this. Um, uh, housing elements are required under state law. Um, it's a mandatory element of our general plan. It's not an option. It's something we must do to stay in compliance with state law. And it has to be done every eight years. Um, one of the central tenets of state law is that is fair housing, that the housing element must take responsibility to make adequate provision of housing needs for all economic segments of our community. Um, the other aspect of state law is that um, the housing element must identify sites as needed to facilitate and encourage the development of a variety of types of housing for all income levels, including multifamily rental housing. So this raises a particular issue for us here in Alameda um, because of our city charter. Our city charter prohibits multifamily housing everywhere in Alameda. So we have this um, 
immediate issue between our charter and state law, which we have to resolve through this housing element process. And then the second big issue that we need to address through our housing element, we did it in 2012 and we did it again in 2014, um, and we're gonna do it again this time, is that the housing element must make sites available during the planning period. So our planning period is from 2023 to 2031 um, with appropriate zoning and development standards and with services and affiliates to, to accommodate that portion of the city's share of the regional housing need for each income level. And the issue here is that this, the way the state law is structured, the zoning to support lower income housing, that zoning should allow uh, to, uh, should allow multifamily housing and it should be at densities of at least 30 units or more per acre. And our city charter says we will not allow any zoning greater than 21 units the acre. So we have a second issue which we have to overcome as we um, work through our housing element issues. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, so can we do it? Yes, we can definitely adopt a new housing element in compliance with state law and meet our regional housing need for the period, the eight year period. Um, but it will require that we adopt a uh, housing element, which is part of our general plan and zoning amendments that are in conflict with art article 26. We are going to need to adopt zoning districts that allow multifamily housing by right and at residential densities above 21 units the acre. As I said earlier, we, we've done it before um, and we were successful before and we're gonna have to do it again. And I'm confident that we can do it. Back in 2009, um, uh, the state sent us a letter, basically put a pointing out this fundamental conflict that we have, that prohibiting multifamily housing and limiting density is a fundamental constraint with significant impacts on the cost and supply of housing, and particularly for housing types. And that under state law, the city is required to make zoning available to encourage and facilitate multifamily development and must address and remove these constraints. Um, one of our um, key recommendations and as and a key piece of this process that we are laying out is that we feel it's time to get some updated advice from the state of California. This is, these are quotes from a letter to us in 2009. Um, it is now 2020. There have been a lot of changes in state law um, and we are in that situation again where we need to reconcile our charter with state law. And so um, we're recommending that we reach out and ask for uh, updated advice um, from the state on how we should proceed with this and that that guidance should help us move through this process. Next slide, please. Um, so the big question, of course, is, well, how big is our regional housing need allocation for this next period? Um, and the answer is, it's big. Um, it's 5,000, it's approximately 5,354 units. It's not final yet, so it will change over the next six months. It might adjust a little bit, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. It's not final yet, but we should be planning and we are planning for around 5,400 units. Um, it's, it's important, I think, for Alamedans to, to recognize and understand um, that the Bay Area has an allocation for that period of over 441,000 units. So ABAG, our regional government, came up with a methodology to distribute those 441,000 units among the Bay Area. And if you can see this map of the Bay Area in front of you, um, which is each city in the Bay Area is represented by one of these little octagons. Um, so down in the lower left is the San Francisco Peninsula, um, with the dark colors, the really dark colors in the bottom are San Jose and Santa Clara County. Up on the top right, we have Vacaville, Dixon, and sort of the um, outer edges of the Bay Area. And you can see what the uh, ABAG has done. They've focused, so the, the cities with the dark, the dark colors are getting a larger percentage of the, of the allocation. The cities with the light white colors are getting are getting less of the housing allocation. So what ABAG is doing is they're putting the housing near the jobs, Santa Clara Valley, the San Francisco Peninsula, and they're um, 
trying to minimize the amount of new housing out in the agricultural areas in the in the you know the the perimeter of the bay area antioch oakley so on this diagram you see pittsburgh is going to have an eight percent growth rate uh, vacaville six percent those are the white octagons on the outer side, whereas Brisbane by San Francisco, the really dark one there, 147% growth rate, Mountain View down in the lower right, 33%. Alameda is at 16%. Oakland is at 17%. Piedmont, 16%. Emeryville, 23%. Albany, 18%. Um, so you can see how ABAG has distributed the allocation among the Bay Area. Um, so our challenge, find a way to provide enough sites zoned to accommodate 5,400 units. Next slide, please. The how, so how do we do this? I mean, it's, it seems a little daunting at first, but when you really work through it, um, we think this is how we're going to do it. And we wanted to sort of let everybody know how we plan on doing it. Um, and state law sort of lays out the process. First thing you do, is you figure out what you already got. And the way I describe this to, to, to people when, when asked is I sort of think about it as like a, as baskets, like there's the blue basket or the blue barrel in the middle. Um, that's what I, that's the arena basket. We're gonna try to fill that blue basket with 5,400 units. Well, here's the good news. We already have, there's already about 2,400 units in that basket. Those are projects that we have already approved, such as North Housing that the Planning Board and Council approved earlier this year for 589 units. Those building permits will be issued during the RENA period. So we're gonna count those units. We have a number of other projects that we've approved but have not built yet. So they add up to about 2,400 units already. So we're halfway there, almost halfway there. Um, there's two, there's two, two projects on that list at the bottom that are, are in red, Alameda Point and Encinal Terminals. Um, they are, Encinal Terminals is shown as a zero and Alameda Point is about 960. Um, those are two projects that we plan to bring back to you soon to the city council for decisions. And they are really, really in the yellow basket. So those, the yellow basket, when you look at, we have the ability to add almost 1100 units to the blue basket by re-entitling those two projects. And what's interesting about these two projects, these these two projects, the re-entitlement is, 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 this is city land that we're talking about. Um, this is decisions by the, by the by the five of you, the city council, to re-entitle land that which we either completely own or partially own, so that we can add those projects and or increase the size of them in our blue basket. Alameda Point, we have the potential to add a, about another 600 units into the blue basket if we re-entitle Alameda Point and change our current entitlements there so that we maximize the amount of units at Alameda Point that we can build during the RENA cycle. We have a Navy cap on a financial cap on the total number of units that can be built at Alameda Point, um, but we need to get every unit possible within that cap into that blue bucket. That's part of the staff strategy. Um, from our perspective, Alameda Point is the best place in Alameda to build housing. It's where we have the land and it's also where we um, require 25% affordability. So we, with every three units we build, we, get, we build an affordable unit. So we're dealing not just with total numbers, but we're also getting affordable units. Um, the rest of the city is at 15%. And Andrew, Mr. Thomas, it pains me to tell you this, but that is 10 minutes. Can you yep. really speed through whatever uh, for yep. future? Two further more slides. slides you have? Okay. Yep. And so, um, all right, we'll just skip right ahead there. So um, the, the, the process here, um, next two years, we keep we keep approving projects. So to fill that blue basket, we'll be back in the next, um, this spring, um, and summer with uh, public hearings on Alameda Point and Encinal Terminals um, so that we can add them to the blue basket. We'll be asked, requesting guidance from 
HCD on Article 26 and state law. Um, we'll be back for another hearing. Our next hearing with you will be in the summer of this year when we'll get our final RENA numbers. And that's when the council decides whether you want to try to appeal that number or not. Um, we then see another public hearing in the fall where we get final direction from you. At that point, you will have the guidance from HCD and ABAG. Um, uh, guidance from HCD and, and, and response on the appeal from ABAG if you submit an appeal. Um, and that gives you an opportunity to give your final direction to the planning board and staff on how to deal with the multifamily overlays um, to fill the basket to 5,400. Uh, we then go to it, that, at that point, we essentially shift it over to the planning board and staff. We do the heavy lifting with the community on crafting the zoning, um, the multifamily overlays, um, and bring back to you a housing element uh, for your adoption after the planning board holds all its public hearings with the community uh, for fall of 2022. So that's the overall schedule um, and process. And I will wrap it at that point. And um, both Paul and I are available to answer any questions. Good work coming in at just under 12 minutes. <laughs> Not bad, that's, that, there's a lot to cover here, but we, we do wanna uh, reserve time for a, a robust council Absolutely. discussion. And I would imagine we have some public comment as well. So council at this time, um, do we have any, do you have any clarifying questions of either Mr. Um, uh, Thomas or Mr. McDougall from HCD, uh, any clarifying questions about the staff report? And Council Member Harris Spencer, I see your hand up. Thank you. And I would just ask um, Planning Director Thomas if you could speak to out at the point what's going to be happening in regards to the numbering, uh, the discussing, you know, what's the market rate and that the affordable doesn't actually count towards that. So with the total number we're looking at out at the point. Uh, that's right. So under under the Navy cap, um, the cap the Navy cap is fourteen hundred and twenty five market rate units. Um, we build for every market rate unit for every three market rate units we build one affordable unit because of our twenty five percent requirements. So what that, so essentially the Navy cap translates to around eighteen hundred units total um, at Alameda Point. That's what we can build at Alameda Point. But we're building market rate units today at Alameda Point. So what we believe is we will have, a, we will have about, excuse me, we're building both market rate and affordable at Alameda Point. We believe by the end of 2022, we'll have built about 450 units at site A. So that means we have about 1500 units left under the cap or 1350. You see what I'm, I've done there? Basically what we believe we should be doing, we should be trying, we should be doing everything necessary to make it possible for us to build all 1400 of those units during the next 10 years at Alameda Point. So basically get credit in our housing element for all of it. Does that answer the question? So then could you speak to how much more it is than what we were thinking? The oh yeah, so it's is? the, um, so one of the things we have to do, we originally were thinking up until the last few years that the cap was at 1425 total, not 1425 market rate. So one of the things that we want to bring back to the council immediately. So we have a Navy cap, which is up at, uh, effectively at 1800. We have a local cap which is at 1425 in our general plan. And that's for total units. So one of the things we want to do is, and we will be recommending that the council amend the local cap, which is 1425 total units, or just remove it because we have this Navy cap, which is 1425 market rate plus our, and plus our uh, affordable, which gets us up to 1800. Does that make sense? You're, you're muted, um, Council Member Harris. I got the I, head nod, so I, I think that's I can, a yes. I can read those lips, okay. <laughs> Council, any further clarifying questions for Mr. Thomas or Mr. McDougall? Council Member Knox White. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to, since we, we did race through that, that the, uh, on the um, slide with the buckets, the yes. third bucket, which we didn't really discuss, said uh, multifamily overlay plus 30 or 30 plus 
growing units per acre. And I guess, could you speak to, can we get to 5,400 at 30 units per acre? Or are we actually, when we're talking multi, I just, when we're talking yep. multifamily, are we talking 90 units per acre in some places, 120 units per acre in some places? Yeah, we, um, if anybody wants to see the longer version of the presentation, we did it for the planning board two weeks ago. So um, it's, it's recorded on the web. Um, yeah, no, um, what we looked at, basically that green bucket talks about the multifamily overlays um, and where we recommend putting them. For example, multifamily overlay on Park Street. Um, we don't think we can generate a lot of units on Park Street just because there's limited space, but we do know from experience over the last 15, 20 years, um, 30 units the acre isn't gonna do it. Like, because we have small sites, um, we have a project we approved at 27 units the acre, I think it is on Webster Street, it's never moved forward. It's too low density. So um, the short answer to your question is on some of these districts like Park Street, we're gonna, we think we're gonna need a much higher density, more like 60 units the acre or 50 units the acre to really be able to, to make the case and make it financially viable to do these projects. That doesn't mean high rises. I mean, it can, we have two story mixed use buildings in Alameda that are 80 units the acre with, um, you know, so it, it, those numbers don't relate to height at all. Um, on, uh, and, and so basically the, the approach here on the multifamily is to, with the community over the next 18 months, let's look at a site let's look at an area. Let's decide how many units we think is appropriate for that area in terms of numbers, in terms of building heights, in terms of massing and size and fitting in. And then let's craft the MF overlay to get what we want. And in many cases, it'll be higher than 30 units the acre. Councilor, just unmute. There you go. Okay. All right. And, and, and to follow on that, and, and since we have a, a, a guest from HCD, I, maybe maybe this might be a question for them. But yeah, as as I remember the the the, the slide, um, the the blue box bucket is all the big land where we know we can build housing. Um, the other one is kind of things that are up in the air. But now, you, when you start getting into business districts and whatnot, we can't just say. 30 units to the acre, 60 units to the acre across Park Street and count every single one of those acres towards mm -hmm. our housing. How does HCD take a, you know, I mean, my, my assumption is that we're going to have to put MF overlays over very large, you know, especially to keep the MF number down, very large swaths of residential areas, the R3s, the R4s, the R6s, et cetera, in order for HCD to say, yeah, the likelihood of you getting a few units out of that already built up area with, with slightly higher density is, how, how, does, how yeah. does that calculation play? play? Let me, let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, do a quick answer and then Paul, please jump in and, and you can tell the council. <laughs> whether I've told them this correctly. Um, part of the process with, for, with, um, with the state on these areas where we are zoning for future development, these are not specific projects, these are zoning. Um, we, we work through what the state calls realistic capacity. So when we zone a site, we say, here's the site or here's the acreage and it may be made up of many parcels. We have to make a proposal to them essentially saying, we think the realistic capacity is X, maybe you know, 500 units. So for Park Street, I am anticipating the need to say to HCD and present to HCD, here's our zone, it covers 300 parcels. We think we can get only about 100 units because that is because there's, you know, CVS site. We think that's available. There's this other site that might be available and we're gonna have to demonstrate to, to, to HCD why we think we can realistically get a hundred units built. Remember just during an eight year period, like it's not f in perpetuity, it's over eight years. So we're gonna have to demonstrate to them why we think what the realistic capacity is and they will double check that. Um, Paul, so did you wanna we, add anything? We're asking Mr. McDougal, we'd love to hear from you. What can you, what can you tell us to further expand on this concept of realistic okay. capacity? I was going to get off without having to respond or talk on <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> um, yeah, Andrew's right on spot. Um, when we look at the sites, you know, there's a variety of factors. Uh, um, one is the suitability of the sites, um, whether there's any known constraints for the development of planning period. <clears throat> a lot of times sites get cold down from there. 
uh, um, you're going to be looking at your zoning, whether it's appropriate to, um, uh, to accommodate the housing for low-income households. That's a density factor that Andrew went into, um, where you uh, potentially have some conflicts with Measure A. And then, uh, um, then you get into how you're actually calculating the capacity on those sites. It's based on your zone and your land use controls. Typically, built densities relative to your maximum allowable densities. Sometimes you get into some nuances where you're identifying non-residential zones that are intended for other uses, so most likely going to be residential. Um, that's kind of what we call realistic capacity. But then the other part is your uh, non-vacant sites. And when you have non-vacant sites, um, there needs to be a demonstration of the potential um, for, for redevelopment that gets into that likelihood that you're talking about. And uh, um, there needs to be an analysis of market conditions, development trends, uh, your regulatory framework, and the extent of the existing uses impede that redevelopment. Uh, um, so oftentimes folks will either, you know, there's different approaches on how you demonstrate that potential for redevelopment in the planning period. Um, one way is, is some jurisdictions will really cull down their sites to the most realistic. Um, we think these are our best opportunities and this is what we're putting all of our chips, we all of our resources. And another is that um, we identify more than what we think. Uh, um, and then, um, and that's kind of what Andrew was getting into. Um, you're accounting for the likelihood that they all won't really redevelop in the planning period. Um, there's also some factors in here that you need to probably want to think about is um, um, no net loss law. So once you go through this fantastic exercise of uh, um, showing us all the, the great sites you have and how you can accommodate your arena, um, that, 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 that inventory needs to be maintained throughout the planning period. Um, not just for the number of units that you've identified um, uh, to accommodate the arena, but also the affordability. So anytime something comes in different, um, you know, if you've identified a skinny buffer, if you will, uh, for that arena, um, you're on the hook to demonstrate where you have it somewhere else. And, um, you know, a prudent move is to think about a buffer there. Um, because um, the no net loss law says if you need to rezone to make it up, it's 180 days. You have to do an 180 days rezoning, which is, you know, uh, not the easiest task. So it's something to think about um, in terms of um, in terms of your, like, your potential for redevelopment. So. Mr. McDougall, can I go back to something you um, said? You used the term non-vacant sites. Tell, tell us a little more about what that, that is. That's basically sites that have existing uses. And so, you know, when there's existing uses, we wonder, well, what's the chances of that expiring or discontinuing in the planning period? And um, and, uh, and, it, and there just needs to be analysis around that. Um, and so there's also some factors as well that come into play that uh, when you're identifying non-vacant sites and you're relying on more than 50% of your lower arena, that analysis bar goes up um, where there needs to be substantial evidence that the uses will likely discontinue in the planning period. And that needs to be, there needs to be findings, you know, from you, the city council, that those uses will discontinue in the planning period. So that's something to think about. And there's also a subtlety there um, where, where uh, um, if you have existing units, um, that um, that has some sense of affordability, then there needs to be a replacement factor on that, or some sort of policy. And you can't, and you can only count the net new units as well. So. Got it. Thank you, um, Council. If we don't have any further clarifying questions at this point, or do we, uh, Vice Mayor? Did I see your hand go up? Yeah, go right ahead, Vice John. Mayor Vela. Um, I. I, I, I <laughs> I did have a sorry. That's, I was that's I was cool. waiting for for a moment of. He uh, wants to uh, intern on the housing element. Great. <laughs> he, has, he has some opinions. Um, I, I I did have a, a question about um, the multifamily and and um, you know I know we've received some communications on it as well. Um, how does this all fit in and and what's going to be the process for that? Um, relative to, I know that it was addressed a little bit in the slide in terms of seeking some guidance 
um, because it's not just the council, it's also our planning board that is gonna be forced to be making these decisions uh, with the, the charter language notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think our, you know, our first, our first, um, our first step is to request or our, our, in our work plan, what we'd like to do is reach out to, to Paul and his, his, um, you know, everyone else at HCD and ask for them to give us some updated advice on what, what is it, how do they think we should um, address this conflict between our charter so that you have, you and the Alameda community and the planning board all have the benefit, not just of the advice of your own city staff. I mean, you know what our advice is. We're giving you the same advice we gave you last time. Um, but, you know, things have changed both in Alameda and at the state level. So we think the first step is to get updated advice from, from the state. Um, I think then um, once we know, uh, sort of our thinking is once we know the um, uh, sort of where the where the all of you stand on Alameda Point and Ensignal Terminals, that's going to then really um, define how much multifamily we need and, and where we need to put it. Um, if your question is, then how do we work through that with the with the planning board and the community. I mean, what that what that slide showed, and we just didn't have time to kind of go through it. Was you know, sort of staff has already identified its top five, six sites to put the multifamily overlay on. We think we can get to about the thousand to two thousand units we need just from those sites, but through a public process of evaluating those sites and hearing from the council, hearing from the community, hearing from the planning board. If, if there are other different sites that people would rather us look at or, and then it becomes a, also a question of, do we wanna do more sites with fewer units per site or do we wanna to try to maximize the units at each site? This is, and then just lastly, getting to something Paul talked about, there are very few vacant sites in Alameda. Everything is a non-vacant site in Alameda. So one of the strategies we've used in the past is we're work, we work very closely with the property owners themselves. Um, we get the property owners to work with us and identify the realistic capacity so that it's, it's essentially the property owner and the city going to HCD and saying sort of together hand in hand, like, yes, we, you know, as the property owner, we are committed to this idea of building this number of housing units in the very near future. So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the approach that we've been using in the past. If a property owner says, no, I'm not going to build housing on my site in the next eight years. Well, that's not going to be a very good, that's not a useful housing site to us at all. And I just, just to add to that, yeah, please. You know, um, we uh, fully uh, welcome uh, the opportunity to provide you some guidance, um, just so you at least uh, um, understand the pathways in the statute. Uh, um, and, and certainly uh, um, we will thoroughly examine the issue and, and the complexities. Um, but I would like to say that there's at least five areas in the statute that are potentially perilous with measure A. Uh, um, Andrew was nice and pointed out too, um, but there's others. And if you like, I can go into more discussion on that. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm torn between, I know we've got some public speakers, but I definitely want to hear about the, the statute, hear further about the statute. Um, if you don't mind, Mr. McDougall, I'm going to just wrap up any last clarifying council this, um, questions about the staff report. This is not our deliberation yet because we will hear our public speakers first. Councilor Rodeso, did you have a clarifying question? Yes, thank you. Uh, clarifying question. So the, um, the general plan uh, for Alameda Point and the EIR and all that stuff was done basically on 1,400 or give or take um, residential units. And as I understand it, recently the Navy has given us an interpretation that allows us potentially to go above 1,400 units, um, given mar uh, new information regarding uh, the ability to uh, build market rate, uh, more market rate housing. Um, so just to clarify, if we're going to go above um, the 1,400 um, units that was done through the, that was um, uh, the impacts of which was calculated, um, uh, uh, are, are we saying that the the the, the new um, numbers that we are going to go after potentially go after for Alameda Point that we will be conducting um, uh, an EIR for those uh, new um, uh, additional um, uh, opportunities that was above um, what was originally um, calculated and included in our, our our initial general plan numbers? Yeah, 
Yeah, we're gonna need a we're gonna need EIR environmental review for all of this, mm -hmm. I mean, not just Alameda Point. All these. I mean, this is adopting new general plan densities, mm -hmm. new zoning ordinances for mm -hmm. these sites. This is all subject to CEQA and will need to be cleared through CEQA. Follow up quick question. Um, could we do that CEQA analysis um, within the eight year time frame that we're working under? So would it be counted towards um, uh, whatever housing that, that we above the 1400 that we that we um, target um, and, and analyze? Could that be, you know, um, uh, programmed within the current housing element um, uh, phase? Well, the e the environmental review has to be done and completed and reviewed by all of you before we bring the, I mean, before you take action on the housing element itself. So, oh, okay. is that the, I mean, so that's you the question. Will, that's what yeah, I'm getting you will, at. No, so you'll be adopting the, the environmental review for the housing element and the new sites, um, you know, next year. Oh, oh no, I, I'm talking about the environmental review for the potentially new housing um, that would occur. Um, yeah, it all happens in the mm -hmm. next 18 months. The environmental review is that okay. the question? Am I? I think so. I think. I, 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 no, no. I, I think we're we're, we're yeah. generally. I mean, um, we need to do an environmental review that talks about what is the effect of building five thousand four hundred units in Alameda over that eight year period, and that environmental review has to be made available to you before you make the decision to adopt that housing element. Oh, I guess what I'm getting at is actually the environmental review that's more specific to the incremental um, housing units above the original 1400 for Alameda Point. So oh, yeah, that's, we, that's, what I'm... that's an interesting question and we can certainly provide that. Like what's the effect of these additional, you know, 400 units on top of the 1400 we always imagined? That's kind of your question. That's exactly, that's yeah, what no, I'm getting no, Absolutely, we can provide that, that. We can make that part of the environmental analysis. Okay. And, and anyway, Mr. Thank Michael, you. did you want to add anything to the uh to that conversation? Uh, just unmute. You're really good at that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I no, forget. I mean, I mean, I just point out you have a few options, right? If you're going to uh, rezone as part of this this full package and do a full EIR um, with the housing element, obviously you could fold in, you know, um, increasing the cap or, you know, you could also program it in your housing element and do further analysis down there. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're, uh, we're ready to go to questions for uh, public comment. Madam uh, Clerk, do we have public comment? We do have four people who have raised their hand. Um, right. The first one is Laura Thomas. All right, thank you. Good evening, Ms. Thomas. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Welcome. Okay. Oh, well, okay, this is my first uh, Zoom um, communication with the council in all these months. Um, good oh. evening. Um, yes, I'm Laura Thomas, and of course I'm representing Renewed Hope Housing Advocates. And uh, you're all familiar with our organization. Um, I guess for the audience at home, I'd explain that um, we've been around since 1999 when um, we began with a, an effort to stop gentrification in the West End, and, and that was um, an effort to stop the destruction of Navy housing. And um, we called for the rehabilitation of the affordable housing there. So our mission has always been inspired by the struggle of Alamedans who came here as war workers, lived in projects, who came with the Navy, et cetera. And um, working class people, people of color who could not achieve home ownership and were basically pushed out. So tonight I wanna to remind you that one of our many achievements is actually getting the housing element passed back in 2012 at a time when the city had, did not have a valid element and because largely because we had intervened with HCD and pointed out that measure A was a constraint. Article 26 is measure A. So, um, you know, it's, it's, since uh, we were able to push the multifamily overlay into that beginning element, much new housing and many affordable units have been built. And it's been a good start, but the crisis continues. And I think the state is more serious than ever. And I don't think these 5,400 units are something the Al Alameda is gonna be able to avoid. So I'm sure Mr. McDougall will explain to you why later. 
Um, he's already indicated that there's some serious problems with Measure A and the, and the statute. But I think it's really important for us as Alamedans to embrace this challenge. This is really a chance to right the wrongs of the past. And the policy changes in these areas such as policing and housing will really force us as a community to walk that walk of justice, which we're taught we've been talking about a lot lately. We're only being asked to do our fair share as all Californians have been asked. And we're certainly lucky to have the base where of course Renewed Hope pushed for that in a suit and got that 25%. And it's an excellent place to locate the Fine. Ferry service and buses, et cetera. Um, looks like I'm running out of time. Uh, oh, of course, okay. these units okay. are not going to solve the affordability crisis simply by being built. We, we know that. That's the next battle. But finding ways to secure um, housing for people is something that we have to commit ourselves to. We have a history in this town also of seeking renewal and justice. And I think the housing element, as unglamorous as it is, is gonna be part of that path. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Our next speaker. I know Jonah City Henderson. Clerk is, <laughs> I see Clerk is doing some jogging, I can see. <laughs> oh, good evening, Mr. Hendrickson, welcome. Hi, how is everybody tonight? Doing well. Thank you guys for uh, hosting your meeting and um, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation tonight. I just wanted to point out that I am currently building about 210 work live units at Alameda Point. I have a building permit, I'm under construction. And those 210 units could be residential units or Maybe my question is, could those 210 units be residential units? It seems like you guys are looking for an opportunity to find more. It would be, we are already under construction. And so we would be open to exploring that from our side if that was something that you wanted to consider on your side. They could be ready as soon as about a year to a year and a half from now. I'm just putting this into on the table. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Hendrickson. And just for clarification, this is just public comment. We listen and we take notes, um, but it, it is not Q&A. But thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Zach Bowling. Good evening, Mr. Bowling. Hi, Council. Um, yeah, I wanted to add on to the comments that Laura Thomas had, had mentioned earlier and also wanted to point to the letter that my colleagues at EMB Law had sent um, on this item. Um, my comments, um, the last time around we used the MF overlay trick as a workaround for Article 26. Um, and it's fair to say that, that the way that it was designed helped contribute to the unmet need in our housing element. We were close, but we didn't get there. And now in the cycle, we have to adjust for that. But given the increase with arena and the tight crunch to find space to draft uh, or to find uh, space in this plan, uh, I'm wondering how HD could trust or consider the MF overlay strategy as being a valid system for meeting the requirements to certify the housing element proposal. Um, given that measures he failed, the MF overlay looks really risky to use this round. Um, so I'm wondering how you could uh, sell um, to HCD these areas that are zoned in one way, but then are not in another way and are in limbo are gonna work. Um, I'm also curious, just sort of a thought experiment, um, if we could meet ARENA under 826 rules without the overlay, I, I would assume not, but I'm curious. Um, the report from the city attorney, the council on the risks of having a charter amendment that directly violates the state law was kept confidential. I understand why the city attorney is doing that, but it raises a lot of red flags for me, likely to limit risk from potentially tipping off opponents to litigation. As a citizen, I wanna know the legal risk the city is facing because it helps us all understand how we should move forward. And I think the residents uh, of the city deserve to understand the risk that of keeping a charter amendment that violates state law. I know the city is in a bit of a pickle. There's not a lot of good options. We um, can fight a reallocation, and I know that um, that rarely works for any city. Um, I know that we're stuck with few options and I uh, would likely put forward that we um, we try uh, to find a solution that uh, works in a way that um, maybe gets rid of that article <laughs> in our charter at some point. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Bully. Our next speaker. We have three more speakers. Um, Josh Geyer. And um, Madam Clerk, I let's see. Um, we that just gets heard... us to six. So we, if we have one more person raise their hand, then they'll go down to two minutes. Okay. Thank you. So I'm sorry. Did you say our next speaker Josh is Josh Gre Geyer? Okay. Good evening, Mr. Geyer. Welcome. Hi. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to thank Laura Thomas, um, who is one of our Alameda housing activism foremothers. Um, I want to endorse everything that she said. Um, this is, uh, we always have uh, more opportunities to try to reverse the wrongs of our history, the, the history of deplorable exclusion on the basis of race and class in Alameda. Um, we didn't quite get there um, this election, but there's going to be more chances hopefully going forward. Um, I live three blocks from Park Street and I walk there all the time and um, I bought this house. We bought this house, my family and I, because for that reason, because we like to walk, we don't like to drive, we like to ride our bikes. And so we experience the Park Street commercial district at the street level all the time. There are many sites on Park Street that are vastly underused. I'm talking about the corner of Park and Clement. I'm talking about the lot across from City Hall and the CVS. I'm talking about the, the area around o Oak and Ensenal. Right now, those those places are blighted, and they are, and we're getting a, a negative amenity value from them. We are not only not only are they are are they not sitting quote unquote vacant, but they are a blight, and they are and they they detract from the the environment that we all um, enjoy in Alameda generally. Um, it, it, as long as as those as those parcels and parcels like them are prevented from developing housing by density limits th th that make that housing um, not economical. We are um, prizing maintaining blighted properties over providing more housing for our community and in all of the benefits that come come from that, not only to the people who will occupy the housing, but to the, the, the businesses in Park Street who will have additional customers and the tax rolls for the County of Alameda and the city. Um, it's crazy. It's 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 prizing the status quo over justice, over fairness, over providing housing for people who need it, and over our city finances. Let's stop doing that. Let's provide more housing. Um, I'd like to find also ask a question. Close. Uh, I believe it was um, Mr. Thomas who said the identification of potential um, sites for upzoning is contingent on current property owners um, and what their plans would be to develop their their properties. That seems pretty crazy to me. Uh, I think that uh, an upzoning, I mean, the, the the whole quote unquote kind of moral hazard of upzoning is that if you upzone, then there's like potential windfall for existing property owners. I think if someone's like, I don't want to, I don't want to develop a, a you know a five a five story apartment on my property on Park Street, it's fine. They can sell it to someone who will and 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 take the money and run, and we get housing, and everyone turns out better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Geyer. Our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Jay Carfinkel. And one more person raised their hand, which gets us to seven. So all speakers will get two minutes now. OK. Um, starting with um, Jay with Garfinkel. Mr. With Mr. Garfinkel. Yes. OK, welcome, Mr. Garfinkel. Good evening. Uh, I don't doubt the sincerity of the previous speakers, but none of them addressed the question tonight, which is whether or not to consult with the ACD. Uh, seems more like they were just intent on getting Measure Z back in action. Anyway, um, and, and I note that Mr. Thomas took, said that we're limited to 20, about 20 units because of Article 26. He neglected to say that we can actually get up to 30 with the overlays. My comments are directed to Mr. McDougall. My understanding is that None or very few jurisdictions in the state have met their affordable uh, housing targets, but it seems to me that HCD has totally ignored them. There's been no punishment uh, meted out. Uh, and I would uh, uh, ask him to comment on that if he, if he wants to. Uh, you know, we're talking about trying to meet the target for the uh, uh, cycle that's about to start uh, and we'll pat ourselves on the back we do that. However, there's another cycle after that. And assuming that sanity continues to uh, elude the HCD, there will be probably be another uh, ridiculous number uh, put forward. So I think that that should be considered. 
and I see no need to consult the state. Mr. Thomas has already told us multiple times with multiple shows uh, and uh, presentations uh, what's needed according to the state. And I think that this is just a very transparent way to uh, try to uh, play Measure Z again. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go on to the next speaker, I would just like to remind all speakers, and that includes those of us up here on the dais, the virtual dais, that we um, welcome uh, your public comments. We ask that you refrain from ad hominem attacks on other speakers, on members of the staff, on city council. We we want to hear um, your opinions, but not uh, not personal attacks. So with that, who's our next speaker, Madam Clerk? Christopher Buckley. Good evening, Mr. Buckley. You just need to unmute. There you can go. you hear me? We sure can. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council members and, and staff and Mr. McDougal. I have a question for Mr. McDougal concerning the state density bonus law and how it interfaces zoning, uh, particularly with the MF overlay zone. And the question is, is there a mechanism to design the zoning so it reflects or anticipates the extra development potential you can get with a density bonus project, both in terms of density as well as increased building heights? So for example, on the Park Street example that uh, Mr. Thomas provided, that suggested to make a project work, you would need 50 units per acre or maybe 60. Well, if it's a density bonus project, I understand that can be increased by 35%, which for a 50 unit project would give you 67 and a half units per acre density. And for a 60 unit project, you would get 81 units per acre density. And then you could also increase the building height if, you, if uh, the developer believes that the project's not feasible without the extra height. So you might zone for three stories, but the developer could ask for four stories or five stories. So is there a way of designing zoning and, this, and then the MF overlay and also this gets into the general plan designations to anticipate those increases so that we have some certainty as to what the maximum development would be for a density bonus project? Um, I hope that's clear. It may be a somewhat complicated question, but that's my question. And that's from Mr. McDougall. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Buckley. Our next speaker. Donna Fletcher. Good evening, Ms. Fletcher. Hi there, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, would it be possible for us to renegotiate the Navy cap so that we can put more housing where there's more space? I'm Thank Jane. you. That, that's your question. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Fletcher. Our next speaker? That was our last speaker. Okay, with that, I'm going to close public comment and back to um, back to the council. So um, I imagine we all have some uh, questions based um, possibly on some of what we saw and possibly on our review of the, um, the staff report. Who would like to go first? Council member Herrera Spencer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I'd, li I'd like to give, if possible, um, Mr. McDougall an opportunity to answer the questions raised by the public speakers. Well, we are going to have um, council discussion, and um, if the council wants to incorporate one of those during your time, please um, feel free to do so. Did you want to do that, Madam uh, Ms. Spencer? Herrera Spencer? So I think the answer is yes. Go right ahead. But I, I don't. Dougal, could could you proceed then? Well, no. What question do you want answered, Madam? Uh, so there were there were several questions that were raised by the public. There were. Which one would you like to start with? At least two, and then I think the third is from staff. Uh, Great. Thanks. The, the first is on uh, our enforcement, I believe. And I would say um, through the leadership of our governor and legislature, uh, enforcement of the housing element is certainly uh, something that is on the front burner. Uh, we have now expanded authority under AB 72, uh, where we can enforce um, the housing element, whether it's um, a lack of action or inaction inconsistent with the housing element. 
uh, we can now pull compliance and refer to the Attorney General's office. That enforcement authority also extends to other housing related laws, including you know, net loss law, density bonus law, housing accountability law, and uh, one that um, we like that most folks don't um, think about, Government Code 65008, which is related to uh, fair housing issues. That basically any action that has a discriminatory effect um, is, is, is essentially no more. Um, and so with that, um, we've been building out our unit uh, um, and it's maturing. And some of you uh, folks might know um, that um, in the governor's post budget, there is uh, quite a push to expand that uh, well beyond what we already are doing. So yes, we are enforcing this and um, it is certainly uh, on our way. Um, the second is the density bonus law. And basically what I was hearing is, is that there's a way to design our maximum densities um, so we can account for density bonus law for what we really want. And um, in other words, sort of re uh, back engineering. It. Like, yeah, we want 50 units per acre, but you got density bonus law, so we're only gonna allow 30 kind of thing. Um, we would generally look at that unfavorably. Uh, um, uh, we, uh, um, um, you know, when we see um, efforts to suppress the zoning um, for a tool that is intended to go on top of the existing zoning to provide incentives for affordability. Um, it's certainly something that, that brings um, pause. If you will. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Harris, Spencer, go ahead and, and unmute. You need to unmute. Councilmember Herrera Spencer, I think it's a two part unmute. I wish I could. There you okay, go. Let's... You had it for a minute. Yeah. Okay. There. Sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. McDougall. Uh, thank you for that. But could you also address the number of floors uh, in regards to that? So like on Park Street, of course, if we're thinking we could end up with four stories, but then we end up with six. Um, I mean, when we when we look at zoning, uh, um, you know, we'll look at the allowable densities and we generally expect that your development standards allow you to get to that maximum density. Um, so sometimes the heights come into play there. Sometimes they don't. It just really depends on the cumulative effect of your development standards and the ability to achieve those maximum. So very well, you might have, um, you know, something around 40 units per acre or whatever, maybe 50. And uh, you might have four stories that allows you to get there depending on, you know, the effects of the other development standards. So it just really depends on the situation. Thank you. May I uh, continue that? You may. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure, I think this might be staff actually, but in regards to uh, Mr. Hendrickson's uh, question about how to, could we look at um, changing the work live units to housing to have it count somehow? Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting thought. So what, what he's, the, the, the uh, Mr. Hendrickson owns building eight that's is the big three-story building at Alameda Point. He's retrofitting it under our commercial zoning for that site as for work live. So we can't report his units as housing units because we define them as commercial units. I mean, because of measure A, we say that's not housing, that's commercial that has an accessory place for somebody to sleep at night. What he is, what he, what we could do is change that zoning for that building and say, no, that's residential. So instead of 200 essentially business units, we would reclassify and say, no, you, you're not a business anymore. You're 200 residential units. Um, you know, what, that, what this would do is give us 200 units that we could count towards our housing element. It also, as a work live facility, which is a commercial business, they're not subject to the inclusionary requirement. So we're not, there's no deed restrictions on those units. If we convert it to residential, we'd be actually picking up our 25% affordability on those 200 units. So that would be 50, 50 affordable units just in a building that we're already planned to develop. So it's, an, it's a really interesting idea. Um, I think it's something we should all look at. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, did you want to comment further on that, Mr. McDougall? On uh, no, just to confirm, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, we kind of refer that to adaptive reuse, and that absolutely. 
Councilor Davis. Great. Um, Councilor Davis, I think I saw your hand up. Yes, you're next. Uh, yeah, just a quick question um, for uh, Mr. McDougall. First of all, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, participate in this. Very much appreciated. Um, my quick question is, my understanding is that the city of Alameda's housing element was out of compliance for many years. And then sometime in 2011 and, and ultimately 2012, at the time, city manager John Russo really took the bull by the horn by um, committing to uh, implementing certain changes, which I think A, might have been um, committing to the density bonus, but also B, um, uh, committing to the multifamily housing overlay. Um, and as a result of that, then was that not the key triggers that 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 encouraged um, HCD to then actually accept the city of Alameda's um, housing element in 2012 or 2013? Whenever you you finally um, accepted it as being in compliance, that's correct. I mean, okay. I, if I remember right, it was sort of a progression. You started out with ADU law and said this effect, you know, this in conflicts with state law, and then you went to density bonus law, and then eventually said, hey, wait, we. Measure A actually conflicts with our ability to accommodate the arena as well as uh, providing multifamily zoning. So, yeah, that was absolutely pivotal. Okay, one more quick okay. question. Uh, I was going to ask you. Uh, okay. Um, you Sorry. referenced. Uh, um, is it okay? Uh, you referenced um, state fair housing law six thousand something. Has HCD used that against any city um, thus far? Um, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, usually, it's a peripheral kind of point. Um, so we haven't directly um, utilized it much, but there certainly is um, attention to it. Um, at some point, I would also like to point out some changes to housing element law, um, as well as overall government code for all public agencies, including local governments, to affirmatively further fair housing. And um, and that's something that there certainly would be uh, um, some issues with measure rate for sure. And I can go into more detail if you like. It's okay. Um, actually, I would, and I want to just note for the um, the watching public. Normally, um, all the council members are on camera all the time. Uh, that we have a council meeting going on. Our vice mayor Malia Vela is expecting her second baby two oh, weeks wow. from today, mm -hmm. and she just needs to get up and walk around. And anybody, any of you who've been in her place, understand what she means. So she's listening. She's just uh, moving. Um, Mr. McDougall, I wanted to ask you um, to expand a little more on um, this um, affirmatively <clears throat> furthering fair housing laws and also the role of equity in um, in reaching the the RENA numbers um, and, and the factors that that HCD looks at. I, um, I represent Alameda on um, ABAG and I'm also on the regional planning committee of that body and we've certainly talked a lot about it but I think um, it's it's an important they're important topics could you just give a little little briefing for the the general public uh, certainly um, um, our duty to affirmatively further fair housing goes back to the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and um, so this is something that's been around over 50 years and um, I mean it's fair to say that many would say we've not done a very good job at it and uh, um, anyways um, with the Obama administration around in 2015 there was a ruling um, to, that uh, took another kind of a refresh and, and uh, just a stronger approach to to implementing that long-standing obligation and, uh, there was a ruling and then there's a handbook and various things like that and then we had a change in administration and then all those things went away very quickly but um our legislature and then as well as um um you know through the you know leadership of our governor but mainly uh coming from the legislature it was, it was ab 686 um that uh, one uh took that obligation and put it into our state law and it's, it's two parts. The uh, first part is, is um, what we refer to, if you like numbers and stuff, is a government code 8899.50. And basically, this is an obligation on all public agencies. And that should be broadly construed, uh, meaning any subdivision of the state, to affirmatively further fair housing and all programs and activities related to housing and community development. That's a big bucket. Everybody should be doing it now. 
And, and affirmatively furthering fair housing isn't just about discrimination, it's about proactively promoting more inclusive communities. So there's that piece. And then there's a second piece that uh, brings a lot of the requirements and a lot of the concepts um, from the affirmatively furthering fair housing ruling of 2015 into housing element law. So now we have this, this duty um, in our general plans, or they will be in our general plans. And um, so there's a lot of analysis. There's analysis around fair housing enforcement. There's a lot of analysis around segregation, integration, racially, ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, access to opportunity, or disparities in access to opportunity and disproportionate housing needs, including displacement. Um, there's also now um, a requirement that when you identify sites, those must be done in a way throughout the community that it, that promotes more inclusive, that affirmatively further for housing. And all this analysis needs to go into your goals and actions. And so when we're looking at your analysis, all of those different components I'm talking about, you know, you're going to want to look at your, your local information. You're going to look at the, the, the patterns, the trends, the policies and practices, the demographics within your community and compare, you know, neighborhood to neighborhood or what have you. But we will also be looking for a comparison of you, Alameda, to your surroundings. And whether you reflect the composition of your broader region, and uh, um, and if you don't, then what has led to that, and specific goals and actions to overcome those patterns, and it's something that that that, um, that is required. There must be meaningful actions, and certainly, we would be focused on zoning and practices that uh, simply limit housing choices, and then so it's just something that will, you know. Obviously, we're going to go through all the mechanics of looking at things formally if you do request that. But I would say, just based on my experience, it certainly will pop up. Can't hear, Marilyn, can't oh. hear you. Oh, wait, I want to take the moment. I got that. I almost got the chance yeah, to take you, you remind me. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm mute. I know. It's the, I think it was the phrase of, of 2020. You're still muted. Um, I wanted to ask you, you had alluded to this earlier in your presentation that there are, how many different problems did you see with, um, with Article 26 that might be um, detrimental to us? Can you, can you run through those for us, please? Sure. Yeah, I believe I said potentially perilous. But, potentially um, perilous. Yeah. Okay. Because obviously we, we do want to be very um, careful and thoughtful if, if, if we do um, ask this for guidance. Um, if you don't, we will actually be glad to provide you guidance as well. But um, anyways, uh, I would say first and, and foremost is something that's very clear that Andrew brought up is that the statute requires zoning for a variety of types. And he brought up a list, and that list includes multifamily, includes um, transitional supportive housing. Now there's requirements around by right permanent supportive housing. Um, it includes uh, SROs and various other things. Regardless of the arena, if you don't have zoning for those types, we won't find you in compliance. So, you know, you can, um, this, and this is requirements that have been put in play probably around 2000. Or um, through AB 2348, and that's kind of why eventually, you know, you sort of steered around. But that is just something that we're not going to to waver from at all. Uh, um, the second piece is when you get into your arena. Uh, um, you know, I mentioned you have to do all these analyses around the suitability of sites and how you're going to accommodate the arena, and it's in total and it's by income group. And so we need a proxy to take your sites and get it to those income groups, and so that's what we call. Um, zoning appropriate to accommodate lower income households. So that's where we get into that density thing that Andrew's talking about with the 30 minutes per acre. And so the statute kind of lays out this scheme, not scheme, but this this kind of this, this approach where um, jurisdictions have sort of prescribed densities, urban areas 30, um, down to 20 for suburban, 15 for rural, and 10 for what, what sometimes we call the real rural. Um, that'd be like Modoc County. Um, and and um, so you know you either meet that 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 threshold or or you provide analysis and so that's something that's an option in the statute you could do that analysis but I will tell you twenty one units per acre isn't going to cut um, that's there's that and then there's a third piece um, where there must be an analysis of potential governmental constraints on the development maintenance and improvement of housing 
And this includes your whole regulatory framework, zoning, land use controls, permit procedures, fees, you know, all old billing codes, site improvements, all of it. Um, and, and then there's now there's even some more requirements just to, to, to uh, disclose any other things you might have that impact housing. And, and so immediately we are going to see the measure by itself as a constraint on the supply of housing, on the cost of housing. And we would probably be looking for programs to um, address and remove uh, um, where possible that so something else on what is going to come into play. The next is the AB 686. That's the affirmatively furthering fair housing. Certainly it's going to come into play there. I explained that. And then lastly is another one that we really need to think about a little bit, but uh, um, there's recent legislation called SB 330, the Housing Crisis Act, um, where there's, a, where there's um, you know, there's various um, uh, provisions that uh, suspends uh, certain actions for the next five years. And one is anything that results in lesser intensification of sites. Um, there might be other things that come into play here, but you know, to the extent that you're carrying out uh, um, the measure in a way that impacts sites now, or multifamily overlay sites, I don't know, um, but that certainly would be an area of pause. For us. And I wanted to ask, and maybe this was all, you know, rolled into your answers, but so what are the consequences of non-compliance if, if a so, city? Sure. Uh, um, well, we have Jerry there. He used to be in Pleasanton, I believe. He even went back. <laughs> He's but, smiling. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just say, you know, just first off, kind of the old school. Well, actually, Mr. McDougall, for those who might not know the, the reference to Pleasanton, uh, give us I'll a little. I'll, I'll fold it in, I promise. Without <laughs> okay. my name, but... Great, great, yes. Uh, um, so, I mean, first is, is the money. Uh, um, there, there are programs uh, um, where you are not going to get access to the money or, or competitive points if you're out of compliance. And something that's important here is, is that... Uh, um, that is not limited to housing money. Uh, you have the OBAG program, the One Bay Area grants that is transportation related that includes a housing element component. Uh, um, there's also the SB1 planning grants, transportation planning grants that includes a housing element component. Um, our governor has, uh, um, you know, through his leadership, we now have a program called Pro Housing Designation where you gain a competitive advantage in certain programs such as infill infrastructure grants uh, um, and that includes a housing element component um, and so you know there's various other programs uh, um, to, to think about where you are no longer you know have, have an edge on uh, um, I will say as part of that pro housing um, designation we are looking to to incorporate that into not just housing programs but transportation programs and now you know beyond what we have with other agencies thank um, you the second piece is, is that you, you can be sued by, by basically anybody, uh, um, you know, for the statute. And so, uh, um, you know, what comes with that is attorney fees. Uh, if someone's successful and, and, uh, um, and as well as the courts have plenty of authority to, to uh, um, take certain actions. And one is to suspend uh, permit authority. And in the case of Pleasanton, they actually suspended non-residential permits, which was pretty compelling. Uh, um, if I remember right, because they were really um, um, focused on and particularly through the efforts of the then um, uh, Jerry Brown as attorney general on the the, uh, um, the effects of um, job housing rules, if I remember right. And uh, um, anyway, so you still, you, you have that now and that's the way the old system, you know, that's still there. Uh, um, but now what is added is, is um, just another level uh, um, where um, you know, things can be referred to the attorney general. The attorney general can go to the courts and um, and then request penalties. Penalties to the tune of 10000 to to 100000 a month. And then, you know, after various other processes, uh, um, uh, um, the courts can, can I believe, uh, designate an actor to take any action whatsoever to get you into compliance. So that's something that's new, something, a road that we haven't been down. Uh, um, but nonetheless, uh, um, you know, significant 
uh, um, additional pieces to the statute that um, really um, brings a little bit more edge to that of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that sobering analysis. Um, Council, who else would like to? Did I see your hand up, uh, Council Member Daysog? No, I didn't. Uh, Council Member Knox White, Vice Mayor Vela, anything from either of you? I've got a, just a couple things. Please. Um, um, first, uh, uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Thomas and Mr. McDowell. Um, both the presentation and the, and the uh, answers to the questions have been um, exemplary. And, and greatly appreciated. Uh, yeah, just from just on, on the, I don't have any more questions uh, really. I think that the, that the questions and, and answers uh, that, that I had are, are out there. Um, you know, I will. Um, I'm very interested. I, I just do want to add one thing. Um, you know, we have this legal analysis. It's come up a number of times. We've received it. I, I am still interested in discussing uh, a releasing some form of the legal analysis that was provided to us by our city attorney on this issue, uh, possibly in the form of direction to uh, remove any recommendations that are in that report uh, and provide it. Uh, I, I do believe uh, and, and agree with the, the public uh, commenters that, that have uh, written to us that um, uh, in this case, uh, it, you know, it is in the you know, we are the city council, we, we represent the, the, the residents of, of the city. And I think it's very important for them to understand what it is that we are uh, wrestling with, uh, rather than protecting the city against uh, them in the future. Um, uh, so I, I would be interested in hearing uh, discussion about whether there's uh, um, any support for, for moving forward uh, with some sort of direction on that. Um, you know, I, I think the for the for the most part, I think the uh, the timeline that uh, staff has put together is 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 great and right. Uh, I continue as I as I have said, uh, 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 you know, uh, offline uh, to to staff in my meetings with them. I I do question waiting to have the conversation about the MF overlay uh, until the fall. I do not believe we need to. I mean, I think we can wait to hear from HCDE, but uh, whether we appeal or not. Uh, uh, the, the presentation we just watched showed that unless we were somehow incredibly successful appealing our numbers at ABAG uh, to the point of getting going from 5,400 units to 2,000, which seems like uh, I have not yet heard anybody suggest we can be that successful, um, you know, knowing whether or not we're going to have a council that is willing to pass a policy that says we're going to ignore the city charter and furtherance of, of, you know, of, of, of fair housing and uh, meeting state mandates, I think is going to be really important. And I would really encourage us to look at the timeline to bring that discussion back uh, late spring, you know, late spring, uh, rather than waiting another six months to have that conversation and then realize that the entire timeline we've laid out, which kind of is, I, I think there's an assumption based in that timeline that that MF overlay is going to is going to be accepted and adopted. And I think if we find out that it's not next fall as, as currently proposed, uh, there's going to be a lot of scrambling. Uh, to try to figure out how to move forward. So um, uh, I, I would like to I would like to have that conversation. Um, you know, I, I feel as I've expressed before, um, you know, and, and I've never met Mr. McDougall. So I, I will say this, I, I am uh, uh, very strongly pro housing. I believe we need it. I believe it is a moral right and a human right. And that we not just in Alameda, but in this Bay Area have uh, fallen down on that um, uh, commitment to our fellow uh, community members for decades and that it's time for us to start doing it. At the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, we ran a campaign just uh, six months ago and uh, asked our voters to-, to <laughs> Okay, so I was just thinking yeah, October, but okay. That's, yeah. that's in your math. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like six months, Tony. It's 2020 was a year like no other. COVID month. Month. So anyway, we just we, we just ran a we just ran a campaign where we asked our community to step up and, uh, and recognize that we are out of compliance, that we need to make changes. And um, while I, I continue to believe that there's a lot of confusion about what is required and what it all really means. And I think tonight's discussion actually has shown that uh, even further again. Um, you know, I, I think that, that we uh, are also in a position where we're uh, standing up and saying that we're going to ignore our voters, which is literally what the MF voter, uh, overlay um, says uh, is, a, is a tricky ethical um, decision for a council to make. Um, and so I think that uh, bringing that conversation forward earlier rather than later, I think would be uh, 
the a, a better timing, uh, a better timing. So, um, but other than that, like I said, I think it's great. I appreciate all the work that the planning board has done. Uh, you know, I, I have seen in various uh, ways this presentation a number of times, and I, and I just uh, it gets better all the time. So, um, thank you to staff for all the work that you're doing. I look forward to the next conversation. Thank you to HCD for all the work you're doing. Um, and, and I'm just going to comment quickly on the Measure Z um, campaign, and I, I'm, I'm aware of the results too. Of Councilmember Knox White and I were the co-chairs, uh, but I still maintain that there was not a clear understanding of what it meant to do what we were asking the voters to do. Uh, with Measure A, with repealing Article 26 of the Charter, and I felt that we, it was a bit of a accelerated campaign. We didn't have as much time as I might have liked to do the kinds of public ed educations that are um, always good to have. And, and so I look at um, this process that Mr. Thomas has laid out as an opportunity to help bring the public along and um, deepen their understanding. So this is, it's a wonderful opportunity to have um, you, Mr. McDougall, um, with us tonight. And of course, Andrew Thomas has been working at this. I mean, I, I smile when you talk about when we got the, finally got the housing element um, certified, because I was on the planning board then, and, uh, and it was a big deal. It was a big deal. So uh, we're going to keep moving forward. Councilmember Daysak, I, I did see your hand up, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Well, well. You're good. You're Great. Yeah. Um, you know, I just want to say from the outset, so, you know, I am unabashedly um, favoring growth control for the reason that, you know, uh, we are an island with limited ingresses and egresses. And I, I think the, the, the lack of infrastructure requires us to be mindful of that. Um, and for that reason, frankly, I was the campaign chair of the No on Z campaign measure. Um, I think the history, recent history of Alameda um, has been that we have been able to meet our housing element obligations um, through uh, having it been adopted and accepted by the, the state um, back in 2013, while also um, maintaining um, uh, Measure A. And the way we do it, frankly, is through the density bonus A, and we also do it through the housing overlay. And, it, and the housing overlay is certainly key because it allows us to, to build at a density that you guys over at HCD require. I mean, I think your, your understanding is that, you know, for housing to be um, possibly um, uh, accommodate affordable, you have to have um, at a minimum 30 units per acre. Well, that's the housing unit, uh, that, that's the housing overlay. And, and frankly, um, I think the challenge for us here in Alameda is to demonstrate to you that, um, that, that we can uh, fulfill whatever our arena obligation numbers are within the context of, of, of Measure A and the density bonus in the housing overlay. Um, I, I think the residents who voted no on Measure Z um, understood that, um, that we have uh, that, that kind of um, work around Measure A. They understand it um, uh, because we had announced that as, as a part of our campaign on the no on Measure Z effort. Um, but I will say this much though. Um, I, I think if we have a number of 5,400 or 5,300, it, it will be very difficult for the city, city of Alameda to, to, to handle that. I mean, obviously, you know, um, state and, and regional and local leaders will have to figure out ultimately what the right number is, but, but we're looking at 5,300. And, and, and admittedly, I will be the first one to tell you, since you are here, Mr. McDougall, that that, is, that will be difficult for us to meet. And that's why previously I had a champion for a lower number. But you know, I'm up for the challenge uh, in terms of 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 uh, meeting our our obligations. But but I'm also going. You know, I, I as one uh, of of five council members, you know, there are some places where where I don't think housing should occur. I mean, I don't think we should uh, put the housing overlay in certain areas. And if we don't put it in certain areas, I acknowledge that. Well, I'm going to have to put it somewhere else potentially um, to make up the difference. You know, um, if you squeeze the balloon in one air, a, area, the the the, the the air is going to go somewhere else. Um, I acknowledge that, um, but I, I do think that 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 we can um, meet our obligations. And but but you know um, the residents overwhelmingly um, uh, 
not only uh, confirmed um, measure A in, in, in voting down no on Z, but that's consistent with, you know, measure A was adopted in 1973. It was modified in 1991 and it was, um, and it was um, confirmed, affirmed, reaffirmed in 2020. Um, but I think that's the challenge um, for me and other council members um, is to work within measure A and the density bonus and the state housing overlay. I think you've laid down additional challenges like um, the affirmative fair housing. And so we'll have to um, study that even more as to how we can meet that. I, I recognize that. But, um, but I, I don't think we're, we're, we're pursuing orders of magnitude, um, different approaches that allowed us to get um, uh, our housing element adopted in, in 2013. I think we're, we're extending a lot of the policies and changes that were adopted in the 2012 housing element. We're extending that into the housing element that's coming down the pike. Um, you know, of course, there are some new wrinkles that, that you just raised this evening that we'll have to address, but I don't think it represents necessarily a sea change um, and, and I think, you know, to the extent that we've, we've um, demonstrated our ability to, to, to meet our um, RENA obligations um, within the context of, of what our um, local zones, um, you know, I think the issue is so long as our, we meet our numbers, um, that, that's, that's, you know, I think that's, that's the ultimate uh, goal. But I will say though, I will admit, I'll be the first one to admit though, I mean, the 5,400 number would be a difficult, difficult hurdle. Um, but, um, but you know, that, that, that's a separate issue. The number that we have to target is, 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 is to me a separate issue from all these, you know, making things work through the land use regulations that we have in place here in Alameda. And I don't see any of us, you know, not wanting to support um, lower income housing. We have a 25% inclusionary policy. Many cities don't have that over at Alameda Point. Um, and we certainly uh, meet our 15% inclusionary and, and everything else. So I think that's the challenge though, is, is meeting our arena obligations within the context of, of the measure A and density bonus and the, um, and the static housing overlay and demonstrating that we can do it. But we will make some tough decisions along the way because some places, in my opinion, as one of five um, should not get the housing overlay. But if, they, if that, those places don't get the housing overlay, then we'll have to figure out where else does to, to make up um, the difference. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. I appreciate it. And Councilor Verdesek, I'm intrigued to hear you acknowledge that we do need to meet our RENA obligations. Um, Mr. McDougall, I, I wonder um, in your position at HCD, do you hear from other communities who say we can't meet our um, RENA allocation because we are, well, there aren't too many islands out there, but maybe, you know, they're hill, hilly um, in fire zones, have earthquake faults in their area. I mean, have you have you dealt with this before? Not once in my whole career, I promise. <laughs> I didn't think so. Well, I, I no, I, I just I would just like to say for the council member, I just appreciate acknowledging the challenges at the starting point and end point, and it just uh, the the momentum of the council and in recognizing that and then looking for solutions is certainly encouraging. Council member Daysak, you have four seconds, but use it just to amplify real quickly by Rena obligations. My preference is the lower. <laughs> So let me be clear about that. All right, and that's time. Uh, Vice Mayor Bell, I think I, had, I said yes. Welcome back. Um, I, I, I do um, share Councilmember Knox White's concern about the timing. Um, I think, uh, you know, I would like clarity. I, I, I do um, think that our charter language and, and the interpretations of potential violations of the charter um, and the um, potential uh, ethical issues that it creates uh, for the planning board as well as for the council. We have our council um, uh, rules of conduct. Um, and certainly, you know, while, while there can be protestations that this is what we intended by uh, the measure um, can be made. Um, I, I have certainly heard from people 
um, that that uh, believe otherwise um, and and voted no specifically because they do not believe uh, multifamily should be allowed. Um, so I, I do think that we need to get um, uh, more clarity uh, for the council and for the planning board. I don't want any of our boards and commissions being put in a, in a spot to have to make that decision on the fly. Um, and I think that we need to get more guidance on that. Um, I'm particularly concerned, um, I, 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 while I, I think it's great to get um, uh, some guidance from the state, uh, I am concerned about local uh, review boards relative to charter violations and things like that. And I, I certainly hope that as a council, um, we can make use of the different buckets and hopefully avoid um, having to uh, rely on um, these, these kind of more gray area conversations um, that, that might not be as necessary for um, meeting our RENA numbers. So um, I, I appreciate uh, the presentation. I, I certainly watched the planning board presentation uh, in full, um, but I, I do want to raise that issue, and I think that we do need to uh, potentially um, even, you know, have that conversation sooner rather than later, just so that we know um, what our options are, where we're going, and and what the roadmap really looks like. Thank with you. that, with that, Vice Mayor Vela, if um, you know one of the things we're being asked to do, is, of course, to review, comment, and provide direction on the city's general plan uh, 2021 to uh, 2020, 2031 housing element update process and schedule, but also to authorize staff to request updated guidance from the state of California regarding compliance and applicable housing law. And I asked Mr. Um, Thomas ahead of this meeting about how long did he think it would take to get an opinion back? And he said, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you, you told me within about 30 days, is that, is that a uh, reason I should, we probably have the, you know, the, the Oracle here, I, we should ask. Yeah, I, I, I I'm going to Google. I'm going to punt that to, to Paul. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how long it would take for the state. Um, Tag yeah. you're it, Mr. McDougall, what do you think? Special, quiet. special for Alameda, we're at the top of the alphabet, you know? <laughs> he punted, but he raised the bar first, right? <laughs> um, I mean, we, we would certainly do our best, you know, to, um, to respect and um, your request uh, to get as soon as possible. And I, I will emphasize timing and earlier is better. Um, so we, we will do our best to, to respect that. But it would help to get our request in sooner rather than later. Yeah, we're, we're about ready to start reviewing about 250 jurisdictions. So. Oh, hello. <laughs> Sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so, Vice Mayor um, and uh, whoever, I mean, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot because I know you're, you're getting no, really I, low I, on energy. I, I certainly would like to, to, to make a, a specific motion to direct staff um, to, to get guidance from the state as soon as possible. Um, I think that, that we, we've, we've all touched upon this issue um, and uh, it certainly has been uh, discussed and in the public realm. So I think the sooner we can get clarity from the state, the better. Okay, all right. Uh, Council Member Knox White. I will second that motion. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? Council Member Harris Spencer. Harris Spencer. Double and mute. You got it. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to discuss that, and I appreciate you know Mr. McDougall being here and and uh, Mr. Thomas. So a concern, and I also was uh, uh, no on Z, and I am concerned in regards to the safety of Alamedans and. I know we talk about other jurisdictions having uh, similar concerns, and I actually think that they are legitimate concerns. Uh, and I, so I do have, I'm going to be asking you, so, you know, we're at 80,000 people now, we have all this other building going on, and uh, 
What about getting another bridge, another way off? How do we make sure, right, we actually can get on and off this island in an emergency? We really do have, right, we're in between two fault zones. There's things like that. We have all these Victorians. I have, I, ha I hear from constituents that are concerned that they're essentially kindling. So I'm trying to figure out how do we, how do we address the concerns of the community who I actually think do understand the measure um, and, uh, and, and yet, uh, also, so from, from my perspective, I'm not really interested in building more market rate housing. <laughs> I'm really concerned about that end. I actually prefer the workforce housing, the affordable housing, but the way it works out is we get more market rate, uh, which I think does add to the gentrification. So trying to figure out how to do this balanced um, is what I will be looking to you to help us do this because honestly, to get to the number of affordable units that we would like, we have to build like three or four more times market rate uh, than what you're actually asking us to do. And we see that, right? So I really feel like the state has not really addressed the issue, that the issue is bigger and just build more and more and more really never deals with our problem of how do we get more workforce and how do we get more affordable and keep, and keep us all safe. Did you add anything to that or? I'm going to let you just see if no, I would I would say absolutely. Uh, um, there's a lot of challenges, and then uh, there's many communities throughout the throughout the state. Uh, oftentimes, we have things like coastal zone resources, sea level rise, climate change, adaptation. There's no doubt that it's not easy to balance all these objectives. Uh, um, and and uh, um, we we rely on you, you know, because you're best suited to make those decisions. Um, you know, can we come in and say, well, you absolutely have to do it this way, probably. Um, but really, um, we're, we're hoping, we're, we're looking to your guidance, to your decision making, to really help your community guide, uh, navigate through these, these important objectives. So, um, yes, um, you know, it is difficult, but um, we hope that uh, you're able to, to, to figure that out. Thank you. I, 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 I would say, like to oh. follow up, sorry. Didn't Sorry. realize you said Janet. No worries. Yes, yeah. back to you. Well, and I don't know if Mr. Thomas could somehow give yeah, us you, more. That's yeah. actually sure. to me isn't it isn't helpful. Sorry. No. Uh, so maybe Mr. Thomas could help us. <laughs> well, look, we we I think this is as somebody said at the beginning. It, this is a eighteen month to twenty month process. It's going to require a lot of community conversation, discussion, and I think education. I mean, that's really what we're doing here. We're providing some education and helping everybody have sort of a common understanding. I hear this. We hear this a lot. Like, how are we all going to rush off the island? All, all eighty thousand of us at once. That's the, 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 the response to that is, well, what is the scenario where we would ever be doing that? We are a very vulnerable island um, and we are vulnerable to all sorts of risks and major disasters. Um, but our issue is how are we gonna get emergency personnel and supply onto the island not how are all are we gonna rush off the island. I mean, even tsunami, which is a very, very low risk situation for us. Our evacuation plan is go to the center of the island. Don't go towards the water, go to the center of the island. In a massive earthquake, you are not gonna wanna all rush off the island and go to Oakland. Oakland's gonna be in just as bad a shape um, as Alameda. So, um, you know, I think there's, there is a sort of some, so, so the, so the idea of building another bridge, that is not the solution to our island living. Um, and it will not help our traffic situation if that's really the concern. If the, if the real concern is traffic, not evacuation, um, building another bridge to a already congested freeway is not gonna be the answer. And we just don't, neither the state nor the region is gonna fund that for us. Um, I just I just go back to what Paul says. I mean, every city has its problems and constraints. And really what the state and ABAG is saying is, yes, we acknowledge those. We're looking to you to try to figure out locally how you want to handle them. But it cannot be an excuse for not dealing with this statewide issue, which is housing. And it's gotten to be a crisis. Um, I mean, it's awful just, you know, just seeing people living in tents and in cars on our streets. Like we can't just let that keep happening um, because 
we're worried about evacuations in the event of an earthquake or a major disaster. I mean, we have to figure out how we're going to deal with recovery after a major disaster, and we have to deal with our housing crisis, and we have to do it simultaneously. We can't say we're going to delay one issue until we figured out the other issue. So I know that's not a very satisfying answer, but. No, so I'm happy to reality. respond though, because we're, built, we're building market rate housing. You got to the point, much of what is being built is, you know, million dollar homes and uh, high end apartments. So that's not going to address your problem of, or our problem of the homeless or unsheltered that you just spoke of. Well, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Who builds housing in, in California, in the United States? It's, it's market rate developers. We don't, as a society, we are not paying taxes to build affordable housing or we're paying very little. We're basically relying on the private sector that relies on a profit to build housing for us. And so that's our, I mean, once we as a society wanna start really funding housing for, for everyone, um, then, and through taxes and through our pocketbooks, well, then we can start changing that dynamic. But right now it's, it's private investors who are building the, the vast majority of the housing in California. So and I'm going to jump in here in the conversation. And, and I speak from um, my perspective as mayor, but also as chair of the statewide policy committee for the League of California Cities on housing community and economic development. And our vice mayor, Melia Vela, sits on that policy committee with me. And one of the things that our um, group studies is legislation coming to us. And we know that the legislature is running out of patience for cities who throw up all these roadblocks to building more housing. And the dilemma that we face among many with Article 26 is that it prevents us from building those smaller units that could be affordable by design, that could be that workforce housing that's so important um, to, to all of us. And so there are a lot of ways we can help solve this problem. I'm really intrigued by um, Jonah Hendrickson's suggestion that maybe we need to look at the, the zoning and, and allow work live, which are certainly places where people live, to be counted toward our RENA numbers. But we're doing, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time, people. And we don't solve one problem and then move on to the other. So simultaneously with meeting our RENA obligations and how will we do that around the island, we have also just launched a homelessness strategic plan. And you can't have one without the other. It's not just a matter of finding those resources, um, medical, substance abuse, mental health uh, resources for folks who are unsheltered, they need roofs over their head. They need transitional housing. People should not be living in the bushes and, and in their cars, and they are um, all over our state and in our fine city. So we've got a lot of problems to solve. A lot of them are interrelated. And then just going to make one exception or take one exception to what Mr. Thomas said about we just can't be building more bridges. That doesn't solve anything. Well, there's this bridge that we're looking at building. <laughs> I wasn't going to let that There's one, one bridge. One bridge. <laughs> one bridge is what we need. A bicycle pedestrian bridge on the west end of the island would allow bicycles and pedestrians to get on and off the island from Alameda to Oakland and um, from there to the BART station and downtown Oakland and many great things. Um, so we we can work on a lot of different solutions all at the same time. But I am also mindful that it's almost 10 o'clock and we're gonna be discussing this for a while. So we've had a motion, we've had a second, we've had discussion. Um, may we have a roll call vote, please, um, Madam Clerk. And before we take the vote, I just wanna echo, um, I'm sure the whole council's thanks to you, Mr. McDougal. Thank you so much for joining us and bringing um, the, the wisdom of your years of experience with HCD um, to us here in Alameda. We're, we're very grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Daysag. No. Herrera Spencer. No. Knox White. Yes. Vela. Yes. Mayor Ezzy Ashcraft. Yes. That carries three to two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Chan and Mr. McDougal. Great to see all of you. Okay, before we move on to item 6B, we are going to be in recess for 10 minutes. We will be back at 10.05 p.m. Uh, but hey, we finished the consent calendar and we're on a roll. See you in 10. Thanks again, Mr. McDougal. Great to meet you. Bye-bye.
but if everybody's ready and Laura, are you ready? Yes, we're ready. Already ready upstairs and all that? Yeah, oh, yeah. we're good. Oh, yeah. All right, well then let's take it away. Okay, item 6B is an oral update from the police chief on police activity. And we will uh, promote the police chief uh, along with uh, Captain Emmett and... Okay. All right. Well, um, we want to to thank um, for being with us our interim police chief Randy Fenn and Captain uh, Jeff Emmett. Hello, and Captain Matt McMullen. Um, it's a trio, and um, we you, there's a lot of things going on uh, in Alameda, in the country, around the country, and and um, our residents have questions and concerns. And so I asked the city manager if we couldn't have an update um, from our police chief. So um, thank you for bringing your able assistance along and um, welcome to all of you. And Chief Finn, I, unless um, uh, city manager Eric Levitt, unless you wanted to say something before we got started, do you? Um, I'll just be brief. Um, Interim Chief Finn is gonna give a brief update on a variety of activities in the police department for the council. Um, there's been a lot of concerns in a variety of areas and he's going to try to address it. He probably will not address every single concern that we've heard um, because I don't think all of you have all the time in the night to hear that, but he's gonna try to address it and then he's be, he'll hit both himself and the captains will be available for questions too. So if there's items or areas that people have interest that haven't been addressed in the initial presentation, they'll be open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Levitt. So um, welcome, Chief Fenn. Let's let's start with you. Oh, very good. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and good evening, and good evening, Council. Um, yes, as the city manager uh, mentioned, I'm going to try to cover a number of things that over my course of, uh, of being here since October, uh, things that have either been asked of me directly or of the department, and certainly the concerns I've, I've heard from members of the Council as well about the police department. Um, I'll start with uh, our staffing. And I know sworn staffing is uh, an issue. When I say sworn staffing, that is not all the full-time employees of the police department, of course, that is the uh, sworn commissioned police officers. And the number of sworn is from my position as the chief of police to our, our newest rookie officer on the street and everyone in between. So uh, we had an authorized budgeted strength in the year 2000 of 111 uh, sworn officers. I unfortunately do not have the number of the actual number we had back then in 2000. In 2005, that uh, authorized strength was 104, and uh, we had 99 actual uh, positions filled. In 2010, it was 92 with 87 filled. Uh, 2015, it was 88 with 78 filled. In 2020, we had 88 authorized positions, and at the end of uh, 2020, we actually had 69 of those positions filled. Um, as of yesterday, the 1st of uh, February here, uh, again, 88 authorized positions uh, with 68 uh, officers actually uh, employed. Of those 68, I uh, should note that seven are actually out on injury leave and one is on uh, light duty. So uh, really 60 officers available. Um, we do have five trainees in the police academy. Uh, one actually graduates this week, which is good news. Uh, and they are not counted in that number of 68 as they actually get sworn in and start uh, on patrol. That's when they will count. Um, at the beginning of this year, we changed our deployment scheme to allow for additional staffing in our investigations division. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, our patrol schedule, the, the men and women driving the marked police cars, is designed for 36 officers supervised by eight sergeants. Uh, currently, we have 32 officers and seven sergeants. Um, unfortunately, we have had an officer resign last week. So by the middle of this month, that will be down to 31 officers in patrol. However, there are three officers that are in the field training program that are now not counted towards that 31 because they're not on solo patrol yet. Uh, but again, as they come out of uh, training, they will count towards that number. Um, Minimum staffing, I know that is a bit of a concern as well. And to, again, um, get individuals up to investigations to help us with the backload of cases, uh, our minimum staffing can go as low as 
three officers and a sergeant um, for a brief period of time in the very mo early morning hours. Um, traffic, our motorcycle officers were allotted six officers with one sergeant. Uh, however, currently we only have two officers and an acting sergeant. Investigations were allotted 15 detectives with two sergeants, uh, but currently it's only three detectives with two sergeants. And then I think it's of note that in terms of supervision and management, we have seven people in acting positions. That includes me as your interim police chief, uh, three acting lieutenants and three acting sergeants. In terms of some crime stats um, or just some stats in general for the police department, uh, in 2020, we handled uh, 52,484 calls for service. That was down uh, almost 11,000 calls for service from 2019. Took 5,600 reports down from 7,800 reports in 2019. Uh, wrote 2,000 citations down considerably from 2019 when we wrote uh, 5,200 citations. And then uh, last year, we made 933 arrests down from 1,300, almost 1,400 arrests in 2019. Crime, everybody wants to talk about crime and understandably so. Um, and I always like to give just this little caveat. When I talk about crime stats, I understand that we start talking about numbers, but behind every number is a victim. And um, I don't wanna overlook that, um, but the reality is we, we deal in these numbers uh, so for part one crimes, which are our major crimes that we report to the FBI from homicide to aggravated assault, robbery, and uh, the like, including auto theft, we're actually down 2.6% in 2020. Um, and I think it's of note that part one crimes were actually up over 19% in 2019. Then when you combine part one and part two crimes, part two crimes are the lesser crimes, trespassing, vandalism, things like that. Um, when you combine part one and part two crimes, we're down actually 8.3% in 2020. Um, and they were up a total of almost 9% in 2019. So overall crime remains relatively low from um, significant peaks we saw in the early 1990s. But again, behind every number, there's a, there's a victim and we can't uh, deny that. And also I think we have to acknowledge that there's a feeling in the community that crime is up. And why might that, might, might that be? Um, well, I think there's some high profile events that, that lend towards that. So we did have three murders in 2020 and we didn't have any in 2019. Um, robberies and assaults are up and uh, robberies up almost, uh, or just over 19% and almost 10% for uh, aggravated assaults. Unfortunately, auto theft is up uh, a 35 uh, year high and it's up 16% over last year. And then a big one, I know a huge concern of the council, of the police department, of the community uh, are our shootings. Shootings are up dramatically. So when you look at 2017 to 2019, the city averaged about five shootings a year. Um, in 2020, we had 17 shootings and already in 2021, just one month of 2021, we've already had four shootings. So um, again, definitely cause for concern. What's What's interesting is this seems to be both a, a regional and national phenomenon. Um, we look just next door to Oakland. They've already had 14 murders in the month of January and they only had one uh, in January of 2020. And I know uh, I've, been, I've been reading about and listening to other police chiefs again, regionally and throughout the country dealing with this phenomenon of increase in shooting since really since the COVID uh, began last year. Uh, in the majority of our shootings, the suspect is known to the victim. Uh, so random shootings are extremely rare. I think that's important to note. However, anytime there's gunfire in an urban setting, of course, it's uh, dangerous and cause for concern. Uh, I think it's important for the community to know that of the 17 shootings we uh, had in 2020, uh, we've already made arrests in seven of those cases so far. So I'll speak uh, in, in a few moments here about uh, the other things we're doing to address shootings. Quickly with traffic enforcement uh, in 2020, you'd expect traffic collisions to go down, more people staying at home. And that's in fact what happened, 541 collisions as opposed to 744 in 2019, 143 injuries collisions last year as opposed to 200 in 2019. Uh, unfortunately, we did have four uh, fatalities last year and there was only one in 2019. So uh, our work continues. 
uh, of the 2000 citations written last year, it's of note that um, uh, 1900 of them were for moving violations. Now, again, those numbers are down considerably from, uh, from 2019, but uh, significant that we were still writing moving violations. Homelessness, another huge uh, topic of concern for the community, understandably so, not just in Alameda. Um, really, it's one of the great challenges of our time. It seems to be a ubiquitous problem, again, not just in Alameda, not just in California, but the entire West Coast. It is primarily a social services issue and not a law enforcement one. Um, but clearly, there is a law enforcement uh, component. We are constantly trying to strike the balance between uh, getting services to individuals who uh, who need them to help get them off the street, not just temporarily, but for uh, long-term problem solving um, with enforcing the law and the concern that residents, uh, businesses and whatnot have. From our policy, uh, our policy states homelessness is not a crime. Uh, we will not use homelessness solely as a basis for detention or law enforcement action. And I will note that of the 933 arrests we made in 2020, 270 or 29% of those arrested um, listed themselves as transient. So when I looked at those numbers, I did see a number of those. They weren't all homeless per se, but um, a good number of them, of course, were. Communications, the way we communicate um, with the community. A lot of uh, consternation inside the building that because of the COVID lockdown, we haven't had coffee with a cop, neighborhood watch, and those things that we would traditionally do to connect with the community. Uh, so we're trying to find other ways to do that. So what are we doing? communications, uh, social media, press releases, those kinds of things. Our goals are transparency, keeping the public informed of public safety matters, crime prevention and safety tips, and connecting with uh, the community with its police department, again, especially during the pandemic. We are trying to find the right platforms to engage and inform. Um, some of the things we're trying to do right now, push for faster release of information, especially as it relates to violent crime, there's been some criticism that we cherry pick the, um, the uh, messages or responses that we get on social media. And uh, we're trying to be consistent across the board, but understand keeping up with those questions is very labor intensive. And uh, we have a very small staff to be able to do that, but that is a concern we've heard and, and we're trying to address. Plans and initiatives going forward. Uh, of course, we're fully cooperating with the city manager steering committee on uh, police reform and racial equity, as you know. Um, we're trying to address our current challenges, uh, dealing with crime and disorder um, amid the difficulties of the pandemic, such as uh, advising our personnel to limit in-person contact with people, including suspected violators, uh, struggles with the jail, not holding people, uh, and struggles with the court, the criminal justice system itself, with the backlog, not processing people in cases in a timely manner because of their own concerns with COVID. Um, we've added staffing, as I mentioned before, to the investigations division uh, last month. We added two people from patrol. We were going to add three, but because of our staffing difficulties in patrol, we could not add that third body uh, right now. We have currently over 400 open cases. So uh, again, that is a concern for us. We're partnering with regard to the shootings, as I mentioned, we're partnering with regional uh, and federal partners to address the shootings. And that includes local, state, and federal forensic laboratories. So as soon as there's a shooting, we are uh, working very hard to get um, physical evidence to not only help link the shootings, help find suspects, but help build prosecutions. Trying to get back to more directed patrols, including foot patrols, but again, that has to be when staffing and calls for service permit. Uh, we hope to train more people inside on uh, crime prevention through environmental design, which is SEPTED, and that will increase our ability to uh, give crime prevention services out in the community. Lastly, I want to talk about traffic uh, quickly. Last year, we were awarded two uh, Office of Traffic Safety grants to address traffic. One was specifically to target impaired drivers, distracted drivers, and provide for education for bicyclists and pedestrians. So um, hope to see the fruits of that here in 2021. And then lastly, we are definitely hiring. Uh, I will address this notion of a hiring freeze. There is not a hiring freeze. Um, as I understand it, council uh, capped the number of sworn over the summer at 73, uh, but that is not a hiring freeze. And we continue to try to recruit uh, lateral police officers, those who work for other police departments, as well as academy graduates. 
The reason we're specifically targeting them right now is we can get them on the street faster than someone we have to send to the police academy. So I think that's probably a good place for me to stop and uh, entertain your questions. Thank, thank you, Chief Finn. Um, and I'll just ask, we've got um, Captains Matt McMullen and Jeffrey Emmett with us. Did um, either of you gentlemen want to add anything? Uh, Captain Emmett's shaking his head. Sure. Captain McMullen might be, but <laughs> he admitted. Captain McMullen, nice oh, to you. Thank you. I, th I think Chief Fenn um, covered it well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I um, I want to just say really briefly, thank you, by the way, um, Chief Fenn, for, for your remarks. And I, when you mentioned homelessness um, a little earlier, um, last, so we did just embark on our um, strategic uh, homelessness strategic plan. And I know that um, some of your officers, I know uh, Officer Pete Larson, who is APD's homeless liaison officer, is working um, on that initiative. And both Officer Larson and Captain McMullen were my guests on my um, uh, town hall, my mayor's town hall last Friday, where the topic was um, what Alameda is doing to address homelessness. And I have to say it was um, it was really impressive just to hear not so much Officer Larson talk about the work he does because he's very humble and uh, doesn't say much about it, but Anna Bagtis, our community development manager who's uh, overseeing our homelessness um, outreach programs said um, the rapport he's able to establish with unsheltered individuals he can do it so fast. They you know, tell him their story. He connects them, helps connect them with um, services that they need, sometimes with estranged family members. And they were feel feeling very good about a young man who apparently just last week was, and they found him a place in one of the community cabins in Oakland. Um, that's a whole another topic for this council um, that we will tackle another time. But anyway, I did, did just want to um, acknowledge um, Captain McMullen and Officer Larson for those efforts. Um, so, um, you know, uh, we want to see if there are clarifying questions from the council, take public comments and then come back to council. Uh, but Madam Clerk, I didn't have a chance to ask you, do we have public speakers? Madam uh, Clerk, so there you far, go. Uh, we're, we're up to four. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, any clarifying questions before we come back for our council deliberations? Councilmember Bedesa, Councilmember Herrera Spencer. Uh, thank you. Just quickly on the matter of the uh, 17 shootings that happened in uh, 2020 and uh, from which we have um, obtained seven arrests, um, are, are there any glaring commonalities that are popping out uh, with regard to the seven arrests or whatever information you've gathered regarding the the other um, 10 uh, shootings? Um, and if there are uh, glaring commonalities, are those commonalities that at this point you can share for some insights? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Member So I, I, I would say that uh, looking over them, um, it kind of runs the gamut in terms of some are uh, people just, they are uh, settling their disputes, unfortunately, with gunfire. Um, some are uh, illicit business dealings that again, end up in gunfire. What we are trying to do is link, um, again, forensically, the guns and the ammo that is used in some of these, because what we're finding is by getting into some of these databases and having our, uh, having our uh, evidence taken to these regional partners and, and federal partners, that these guns are being used in other places for other crimes, not just here in Alameda, not just in Alameda County. So that is a big component of trying to get guns off the street so that, uh, again, what typically would be a, a dispute between people doesn't end in gunfire, but it's handled more appropriately. Just, just to Quick follow up question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, on the same topic, um, because people have talked about, you know, people getting released by from prison and with the possibility of still engaging in criminal, is that an issue that that we've been able to 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 observe, or or we don't have enough information yet? Well, what I can tell you is that um, over the last couple of years, at a, at a high, the uh, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation had about one hundred and thirty thousand people in in prison and they're down to about 89,000 now. 
and that is a combination of uh, criminal justice reform over the last decade in California, as well as uh, the COVID. And so, um, while it's anecdotal evidence at this time, I can tell you that we believe that part of the homeless problem we're seeing again, not just locally, but regionally, uh, and some of the crime problems are connected to folks that are coming out of the prison system that are not ready to assimilate yet. There's not the services that will help them assimilate to jobs and families and housing and those kinds of things for pro-social behavior. And it ends up being another problem for the, for the police in the community, unfortunately. Thank you. That's all for you. And then Council Member Herrera Spencer. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I do wanna thank the chief and the captains, and I did watch the tapes. Um, and I thought, honestly, you were very forthcoming with your answers and you did a lot of research. I think it's very important to acknowledge your efforts. I also wanna thank you for being here tonight. In fact, I had done a referral back on January 4th uh, that is still on the calendar. Council hasn't ruled on it, but somehow you're here, so that's wonderful. Um, I wanna ask uh, in regards to if you have an idea of when you're going to get to the 73 if you think you're going to get to the 73 how much time that will take and depending upon when that is do you think i mean at some point i'm going to be asking you for you all for your professional opinion what should the number be um and what is how do we address so the shootings if you know if there's any uh tools that you feel you're lacking that would help address uh the crime um, and then the, there were some other questions that I didn't uh, know what the answer is like, you know, the cameras, what's the status of that, as well as the sale of the armored vehicle. My understanding was that there is direction given about that. So I don't know, um, just to bring us up to date. Thank you very much. Hey, I'll, <laughs> I'll see if I can do my best on those <laughs> questions. You're more than, more than welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, with regard to the right number, I think Part of the, uh, the issue now uh, as a city we're facing is, or we're waiting upon rather is a better way to say it, uh, is the steering committee's report. I think uh, Alameda is, is going through a time that many uh, communities, many uh, jurisdictions, uh, both in California and throughout the country, what do, what do we want from the police? And as that, those conversations move on, that will of course dictate uh, what we need in terms of personnel. So, um, I think I have to be a little careful to not put the uh, proverbial cart before the horse there. However, I can tell you that when we need more bodies in investigations, that that's just is glaringly apparent uh, with the number of open cases and the few detectives that we currently have to work them. And the problem is for every uh, officer we take out of patrol to put in investigations, that hampers our ability to do the things we want to do in terms of proactive policing, especially community policing, connecting with folks, because the less folks we have in patrol, the more calls they have to handle per officer. So that is a that is a tough balance that we're trying to strike right now. Uh, how long it would take to us for us to get to say uh, 73? You know, there's a uh, recruiting problem not just here but uh, throughout the profession right now, um, and so I think uh, that is an issue as well. We're all uh, we're all trying to grab the same uh, the same limited pool of individuals. We're also when I say we police departments in general, sheriff's departments, law enforcement in general. We're trying to diversify. We're trying to reflect our community. So that also shrinks the, the pool a little bit. So um, that is going to be an ongoing effort. And I, and I know it's been an ongoing effort, not just in 2020, but for uh, quite some time. And unfortunately, will be uh, for some time to come. Um, in terms of some of the other things you mentioned, cameras, and I think you might mean the, the license plate readers and all that. And this is partly why I brought the captains or asked the captains to join me because of course they have the institutional history that I don't um, and I'm not sure about um, where we are with license plate readers. And so maybe I can pause there if one of them, if that's okay, uh, Mayor, it's to answer. It's fine. We didn't bring them along just to look good on camera. So uh, <laughs> which of you would like to address that or both? I have a, a face for radio, so I'll do my best. <laughs> I, I do know that, that this was a matter before the council. Um, I don't want to put a date on it, but it was a couple years back. Um, and I'm not sure if we ever circled back and had a resolution to that or not, but I'll leave my comments, <clears throat> excuse me, at that. That I do know it was there. I have drafted a um, RFP for it. And then um, for a lack of a better term, it is stalled. 
Thank you, Captain McMullen. Councilmember Herrera Spencer, was that all for you? No, go ahead and unmute. I know there's a magic sequence. I just don't know what it Thanks. is. Yeah, uh, I heard you, City Manager. Is that you? Yes, yes she Sarah. also asked, she also asked about the vehicle, and on the vehicle that is going to come back to council. We were waiting until after the report from the committees before we brought it back to council. Um, and the way the council action was, was to bring back options and, um, and how it would go about being sold. And so we are bringing back a report to council and we're also wanting to make sure council is aware. I view with the vehicle, there's a difference between purchasing a vehicle which would be in the $300,000 range and getting rid of an existing vehicle. And so that will be part of the discussion that would be brought back to council. Okay, thanks, Mr. Levitt. Uh, Councilor, wait, wait, is, that, is that all for you, Councilmember Harris? That's it. okay. Okay, any other clarifying questions from council members before we go to the public comments? Councilmember Knox White. I, well, I was going to actually ask if we could give the city manager the ability to talk about it. I think uh, he and I have talked about the license plate readers a lot over the last year. And my understanding is it wasn't that, that there was a definitive decision by leadership not to move forward with the license plate readers last year. If that's wrong, I just wanted to you can clarify it for me, but I also just wanted to kind of. That's a question is the city manager. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Levitt. So um, this issue, I have some familiarity, not, not as much as probably other people in the room um, on familiarity. Um, I think there were some restrictions or conditions put on the license plate readers at the time. I wasn't here. It was prior to me being the same manager. I think some of those had some concerns for um, leadership of the police department at the time that they would not be able to be fully utilized to their, to their abilities. And I would say that Captain McMullen probably has put it best that it's sort of stalled and it hasn't moved forward from that, that point forward. I will say leadership at the time, when you look at the two captains now and, and the chief now, um, I, when I got here about two years ago and I went to a command staff meeting, I think there's only one person that's still in that lieutenant captain chief seats that were here at that time. So, so there is some lost um, historical perspective from me on that, um, just because there's been a lot of change over in the department as well as in the city manager's office during that time between the initial discussion at council and today. Notwithstanding lost historical perspective, do you, do you plan to bring that issue back to the council, Mr. Levitt? Um, we, we can bring it back. Um, I want to, um, we can bring it back. We would have to, um, there's analysis and we can bring it back. It would be a city council decision whether we brought it back or not. Um, I, I would sort of rely on the council for that discussion right now. We haven't had a lot of discussions on it. I'll just be, we haven't had a lot of discussions internally on it with the new, um, administrative team in place at the police department. Thank you. I see. Um, and I'm sorry, Councilmember Knox, what you still have the floor. Um, and then so I'll go to you, Vice Mayor. Following uh, up on Councilmember Daysog's uh, questions about shootings. Um, when you've discussed shootings, you've talked about uh, the, the, the steps that uh, APD has taken. Um, um, I don't mean this pejoratively. I'm very happy to hear that you're increasing the investigation, <laughs> the size of the investigation staff. That was something that when the, uh, the captain was uh, uh, acting chief, uh, he highlighted in July, I believe it was, as a, as a major, or maybe it was, um, sorry, I guess it was September when we met uh, as a concern. And it was something that you and I talked about when you came on board as well. So, uh, it, you know, clearly a need and, and a good use of our, of our stuff. What steps have we taken, or uh, I think Council Member Spencer may have, uh, Herrera Spencer may, may have asked this too, could we take to, I guess, when I'm hearing from the community, they're, they're less concerned about, are you catching the people who have shot people? Uh, they are more um, on the, uh, on, under the impression that somehow there are things we have, that we are not doing that could have done, uh, that, that could have reduced this. And so I guess my question is, what have we done since this has become a problem and what could we do? Or is this, as I, as I think it may be more of an instance of kind of not you know, random, thing, ra random, random things that are happening between people who are having a beef and for some reason guns are coming into it these days. The, the question is how do we prevent shootings? Is that it? 
how do we address the, yeah, how, what, what steps are we doing to, what have we done? What steps have we taken to address the shootings? I think that, I don't know. Do you, to address them, okay. Okay. Yes, Chief, thank you. Chief in, yeah. So I, I think going again back to that piece of trying to get uh, 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 guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them and the guns that shouldn't be on the street. So that goes back to that forensic piece. The more we can link them and get those guns uh, out of circulation, uh, obviously we're all safer because of it. The other component though, and I think this is a, this is a more uh, difficult one um, to wrap our hands around. And this is again, not just uh, for Alameda, but I think this is, uh, where we are in 2021 after after an interesting year last year is again what we want out of the police because traditionally our tactics would be uh and i'm going to speak again generically law enforcement tactics would be uh more car stops more uh encounters trying to proactively get uh guns again off the street and get those who are carrying guns off of the street the problem with that is, or I should say the, the, the rub, if you will, is that that increases um, oftentimes the criticism of the police for um, making stops that, that now, of course, are under greater scrutiny that the community has said, we want less, um, we want some of these stops to not happen. And, and here's the thing, people can say, well, just, we want the police just to handle uh, violent crime. The problem is, violent crime is actually a very small component of what we do, thankfully. Um, most people will never be a victim of violent crime, but that doesn't mean it's not a tremendous impact to individuals and to the community. Um, to address it though, we, have, we end up enforcing other crimes. We end up doing other parts of our job, having those interventions that I think society in general is trying to figure out is that what we want the police doing going forward? So um, I think that is the great challenge here going forward, especially here in, in Alameda, quite frankly, given what occurred in 2020. And I think this is why we're all looking forward to seeing what the steering committee brings forward to council is what will policing look like in 2021 and going forward here in Alameda and how will that meet the need? Because when I say the things I'm saying, the tightrope I'm trying to walk right now, there are those who are going to say, we are so glad you're not making those car stops anymore, chief and police department. And there are other people simultaneously saying, this is the problem, chief. Why aren't you making more car stops? Why aren't you doing it? And, and that is a tough, I'm walking that tightrope as a chief of police with 30 years experience. I have a, I have a department full of uh, men and women who are trying to do the right thing many of them far less experienced that are trying to navigate those same choppy waters and trying to figure it out. So um, I'll stop there as my uh, semi-editorial, I guess, in, in, in answer to your question. I hope I was able to a little bit. Oh, that, 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 was, that was great. And, and I didn't want to, my, my question didn't suggest there were things you should have been doing that you weren't. I, it's a very tricky issue. I just wanted to, to, to understand if there was anything that we could have been doing or have, have started doing differently. Um, so I guess my, my last question is related to what you just brought up. Um, as the city manager and the city attorney know, and you know, um, you know I, I, for about ever since I was elected, I have been working to uh, get the city to release an analysis of our traffic stops based on race. And uh, we have, <laughs> for, 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 for many really unfortunate and, and problematic reasons, that has not yet happened. But at the middle of last year, um, uh, we did kind of come to an agreement where the city was going to engage a consultant to look at that data and provide something publicly. Um, my understanding because of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter, there is a lot of demand on certain um, contractors and whatever else that, that, that could do this work. Uh, but this is really just statistical analysis and doesn't really require a deep law, law enforcement understanding to do this. And so I'm wondering if, if we can get an ETA you know, in, in a reasonable amount of time, what is the ETA for for getting this information that that you know should be public um, and could help us address some of the questions about who's getting stopped and what kinds of stops and you know disparate impacts and all those things that, that is part of the conversation we started last summer. And that might be a question for the city manager. I don't know, but um, I, I just whoever would like to take it. Uh... 
City Manager, let me you unmuted, so I'll call on you. <laughs> well, um, there was a company, and and I haven't had a chance to follow up on this part. I had a conversation recently with the with Council Member Knox White today, I believe, but. Um, there was a company that we were trying to contract with that was going to do this that was more law enforcement. I think we're sort of in the queue, but I don't think we have a short time frame on that. And so um, that's something we'd have to get back on an ETA um, if we were to try to change direction on that. And Captain Emmett or Captain McMullen might know, I, I think – we, it was around the fall when you were looking at this company, and I can't remember the name of the company right off the top. I also, after they're done with that, I did have one other thing on the on the uh, license plate readers, but um, I want to go ahead and finish this off before we go to that. Okay. Captain Emmett, did you want to add something? The name of the company that we're trying to work with is uh, CPE, Center for Police Equity. Um, when we first had some initial talks back in September, they're extremely um, backlogged from the amount of requests that are coming in. Um, I've reached out several times since then, and I'm still waiting to get some confirmation back as to when they can start. Part of that delay is the um, change of our CAD and RMS system that we're currently going through. They have to be linked into that so that they can pull not just traffic stop data, but all of our data that they can um, present. Um, it is a free service as long as we abide by their MOU, which in, in the brief talks that we've had with them seems very reasonable. Um, and we could do this um, for years to come. It wouldn't be a one-time thing. So um, there may be some other companies out there and if um, we want to explore that as well, I'd be more than happy to look, in, look into that. Thanks, that's, that's good information. Um, so, City Manager Levy, you wanted to talk about LPRs, and I know the Vice Mayor's had her hand up, and I see her hand up there again, uh, Councilmember Herrera Spencer, but we're going to go to the Vice Mayor uh, first. But, City Manager Levy, why don't you go ahead and tell I, us what you, you want to do about LPRs? So, just one thing to add is all, during that term of the discussion, the council did put in right before um, the pandemic hit, you put in privacy um, ordinance and policies, including facial recognition. So that's added, an, added a new component to LPRs and whether they're appropriate or not in certain ways. And so that's one of the evaluations that we'll have to do before we bring it back to council. And I forgot to bring that part up, but that would be a component of how we would look at that particular issue and how that fit into, into the city of Alameda. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bella. Um, and I was going to, one of my comments was that uh, I know that the LPR issue in the past had a lot to do with privacy issues. Um, there were concerns about um, limiting the scope and excuse my son who's sleeping on my lap. Um, but uh, there was uh, concerns about um, the scope of the, the photograph being taken um, because, and we had a long council conversation about um, limiting it to just the license plate or just the vehicle or, or how, how much um, outside information was also captured in, in a photograph, how long were we storing it, who had access to that. Um, and uh, I, there were several follow-up meetings um, that, that occurred. Um, I know uh, council members were invited to go uh, and meet with um, police department staff to talk about kind of the pros and cons of um, that data capture and how long it would be, be uh, maintained, what it could be used for, when it could be accessed, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other thing that happened uh, in the intervening time was that the state um, also changed public records request uh, laws, uh, which also added another element. And I think that there was some concern about, did we have adequate staff for processing all of those public records requests. Um, what would happen if somebody had some sort of uh, domestic issue? Um, how do we protect releasing information to an abuser, things like that? Um, so my understanding was that was all part of the, the conversation that was ongoing relative to the LPRs. It wasn't kind of a, a clear cut issue of do we get them or not? 
um, there were all these other added things that, that were going on. Um, you know, I, I want to go back to the, the, um, the, the issues or the incidents involving the use of firearms. Um, and, and my understanding is that many of these instances, uh, Chief Ben, when you're mentioning there, that many of them occurred uh, between parties that had knowledge of each other. Are we talking about um, business transactions, domestic uh, issues, those sorts of things? Yes, I don't uh, have the numbers directly in front of me. A, a number of them were domestic, just that domestic issues. Um, a couple were involved with prostitution, uh, illegal drug sales, and then uh, in the furtherance of street gangs. And and so, you know, I, I think part of this goes back to obviously um, training and expertise. There's different types of uh, those, the underlying um, relationships and interactions um, would require different types of policing tactics. So it wouldn't be necessarily, when you're talking about traffic stops, that might be more related to, um, you know, drug, drug sales. I know we've had some traffic stops that have um, un uncovered, uh, you know, evidence of, of kind of large transaction uh, sales and things like that in the past, as opposed to a domestic incident, correct? Right, absolutely. So uh, not just the, the domestic violence, you know, we don't have a domestic violence advocate on staff. We don't have a, a youth services unit where we're able to intervene in the lives of kids and, you know, uh, defer them from the criminal justice system. And some of those things that we've had those programs here in the past and certainly other police departments have. So you're right. Um, in terms of what I was talking about, the proactive policing stops some of those, you know, prostitution, drug sales, and some of those other things that, of course, draw the violence as well. Understood. And and, and um, can what I'm sorry to cut you off, Vice Mayor. We have to do a little bit of housekeeping because it's almost 11 p.m. So um, two things I want council to know: we have at least nine public speakers waiting to speak, and so I might suggest that when we get this vote about um, extending past 11 o'clock, we go to our public speakers and then come back to our council discussion, which we would be doing anyway. But for right now, the city clerk reminds us that we need to vote before 11 p.m. and it's 10.52 to consider the remaining action items, which are 6C, our naming policy. And then there are four council referrals, 9A, housing unit calculations, 9B, crime, 9C, Wi-Fi, and 9D, Webster Street beautification. And, um, uh, so um, I will entertain any motion to continue up to 11.59 p.m., um, but I won't support anything a minute past that. So who wants to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion. Councilmember Carrera Spencer. Thank you. That we uh, complete this item, but then jump to the referral if, we, if possible and not and um, carry over the renaming policy till the next meeting, but uh, member day socks referral. Mine, we wouldn't need to hear and I'm, I will be withdrawing it in regards to the policing. Uh, and I'm fine ha having the, my referral regarding the Wi-Fi wait until the next meeting. But I do think it's, so my motion would be that, right, so that we finish this item here for the public speakers, but then if, if we can jump to member day socks referral and then carry over um, uh, the 6C, I believe, is the uh, continue 6C. Mm -hmm. Okay, and end by 11:59 p.m. Correct. Thanks. Okay, we have that motion. Do we have a second? Councilmember Dayzak, was that you waving? You second that. Okay. So, um, Madam Clerk, you got that. Is and and is there any reason we couldn't continue 6C to another meeting? Maybe even the next one. I think we can we can bring it back. There is some time issues with um, some future other naming things coming forward, um, but um, hopefully we could get it on the next one and maybe move it up in the agenda, like we did with the um, the PLA one, like that. Well, we could just have it earlier on the regular agenda. I that. see what you're saying. We have an agenda item a meeting tomorrow. Okay, so and then Councilmember Herrera Spencer, you you heard that she's saying she'd like to hear. Uh, Items 9A, she's willing to pull uh, 9B, and I can't remember the rest, but we'll keep going until 
OK, maybe have a roll Thank call you. vote, please. Councilmember Daysag. I could hear him say I. I. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> Good evening. Herrera Spencer. I. Uh, Knox White. Uh, no. Uh, Vela. No. Mayor Ezzy Ashcroft. Well, I would have voted with you, but, and I do, but we need four. So, um, do any of the no votes want to make a, a their own motion? I, I'm happy to, if, if we can keep nine A short, I would, and then go back to six C. I'm happy to do that. But I, I, I think we can. I honestly think we can with a little get there. So, and and if we don't get there, six C will bump to the next the meeting. But I just don't like. Okay, so let me understand what you're saying. So you want to when we finish this item go to 9A and then back to 6C, is that what right. you're saying? Yes. Yeah, and finish by 11.59. Yes. Okay, do we have a second to that motion? Council Member Desai, are you seconding? Okay, um, we have a motion by Knox White, second by Desai, roll call vote, please. Uh, Council Member Desai. Aye. Herrera Spencer. Aye. Knox White. Aye. Vela. No. Mayor Ezzy Ashcroft? Aye. That carries four to one. Oh, and just for clarity, that was just, we're going to just take those two other items, right? Yes. Okay. So we might finish before 1159. We'll do our best. Okay. So um, will you also indulge me in hearing from our public speakers next? Because I just hate to keep people out. I mean, we keep ourselves out, but this is the public. Okay. So um, uh, with that, Madam Clerk, I think you've told me there are nine speakers. So. Yeah. Now up to 10. <laughs> 10, but, they don't, so it, but the point being um, two minutes per speaker, correct? Yes. Okay, Perfect. let's have our first speaker, please. Thank you. Aaron Fraser. Good evening, Mr. Fraser. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you to the city manager and to interim chief Fenn for coming tonight. Um, I'm gonna go quickly since I only have two minutes. Uh, first of all, uh, with all due respect to the city manager, I believe he's misread the notes and misremembered the meeting and the direction from council. It was not to explore options to sell the armored vehicle. It was to begin the process of selling the armored vehicle. So his report, which he purports to have ready for council to review, is an error and should be reexamined. Uh, number two, please comment, Chief Interim Chief Fenn, on the number of APD officers who have been promoted without passing the requisite exam. And the reason why people who didn't pass the requisite exam uh, were promoted. Item number three, and before the mayor interrupts me to say this is not public q and I appreciate that. Number three, please comment on the, pro uh, on the progress of the investigation into the individual who brandished a semi-automatic weapon against peaceful protesters. It seems to me that it would have taken a couple of hours to go door to door in the neighborhood and ask, do you know this person and get some clues? But, you know, I'm not a police officer, so I maybe the obvious is, is, is too stupid. I don't know. But it seems to me that there has been no public update on this crime, including in your comments, and I find that offensive and, to be honest, bias. Uh, number four, finally, with, uh, not finally, well, I guess I might run out of time, but with regard to the break-in at APD, I think a sports analogy may be apt. I played football and I remember a coach telling me that if you don't go hard in practice, you won't go hard in the game. And I think the break-in at APD demonstrates that. You don't solve the crimes that are happening to normal Alamedans, and so you you act with lax uh, and ineptitude with regard to APD's headquarters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. And you're absolutely correct. This is public comment. It is not Q&A. And I also believe it's possible to state one's views without um, including insults and um, layers of sarcasm. It's something that um, mayors have talked about in some of our forums and um, maybe it's just a Zoom phenomenon, but um, I'm really grateful to have our representatives from the police department here to answer these questions at a very um, fraught time for communities, for police departments, and I look forward to hearing the rest of our public comments. Our next speaker, please. Uh, Cherry Johansson. Good evening, Mr. Hansen. Can you unmute? Yeah. Here you are. There I am, I think. 
<clears throat> Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming, uh, Police Chief Fan. And um, I've enjoyed listening to to all of the comments. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you brought up communication because I do think that that's one of the areas that even if you're short staffed, that um, maybe we can improve a little bit on how events and how um, investigations are made. Um, I had a very dear friend who was actually threatened by the gentleman at the MLK um, uh, rally in protest and she had a granddaughter. Ms. Jansen, do we lose you? I see your name, Madam Clerk. Um, she's still unmuted, so. Um, yeah, I see that. I wonder if her internet dropped. Let's um, hold Ms. Johansson uh, or set her aside and um, come back to her if she logs back in. Okay, uh, next is Grover Weeman. Good evening, Ms. Weeman. Wayman. Brown. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for um, talking with us tonight and reporting back, um, Chief Ben. And I just, I was, I was worried about a number of things that I heard. And one, I just wanted to say something that wasn't said about the increase in shootings, which is that we're living in a time of unprecedented poverty and insecurity in our nation. And it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that when we are living in insecurity, people harm each other in a country that fails to take care of the citizens' most basic needs. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that I noticed that the chief said violent crime is a, a really small part of what we do, but then said, that to stop violent crime, they have to stop people for nonviolent um, infractions, but then also talked about how people who are released from prison are a large part of the unsheltered population and were referred to as unable to, unable to assimilate. But imprisonment is violent and traumatizing and people face significant job and housing discrimination when they leave prison and their family bonds are severed and they lose jobs and then are forced into poverty. So the justification that was just given that we just heard that traffic stops, which in Alameda target black and brown drivers more often than white drivers per capita, that it prevents violent crime is admitting that we as a community are funneling people into prison disproportionately because we, you theorize that it might prevent violent crime. Um, and then we got the number that, that citations were given to 29% of unhoused people. Thank that you the for department your comments. Heard. Our next speaker. Alexia Aby. Good evening, Ms. Aby. Aby. Go right ahead, you're unmuted. Hmm. Um, Let's see. Did we remind everybody about needing to make sure you have the most, most current version of Zoom? We did not. Um, if, if they're able to unmute, that's usually the problem. So uh, maybe, yeah, the, the microphone isn't showing any volume, so I'm not hmm. sure. Okay. Um, maybe we can go pause and go to the next person and sure, sure. We'll do yeah that. um is sullivan good evening hi um thanks for coming tonight chief ben and your thanks for your presentation um i urge apd to investigate support for the capital insurrection as well as any ties to white supremacist organizations among apd's ranks Community calls for this investigation have been dismissed and ignored. We know that a former OPD officer proudly admitted to traveling to DC on January 6th and that some current OPD officers liked and commented on his social media posts. The possibility of APD officers harboring the same racist sentiments as those OPD officers is not far-fetched. 
About almost a month has passed since the events at the Capitol, and while OPD has opened an investigation, APD has shown no interest in identifying and removing officers with ties to white supremacist groups. This is a public safety issue. Armed white supremacists should not be patrolling Alameda or responding to 911 calls, and I urge you to investigate and root them out of APD. I'd like... Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, the gunman who threatened the anti-police terror project's car caravan on MLK Day is still at large, and there is no apparent effort on the APD's part to identify and apprehend this individual. Again, armed white supremacists are a threat to public safety. Um, additionally, there is misinformation circulating, especially on social media, about APD staffing and crime rates. Um, thank you, Chief Ben, for noting that there is no hiring freeze, rather a cap on the number of sworn officers, and crime has decreased from 2019 to 2020. Please make this information widely known and start with social media, as that is where there is the most information, misinformation spread. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Go back to Alexia AB and hopefully that will work now. Okay. All right. One more time. Ms. AB? Yeah, I can see that her microphone doesn't show any volume in it. She's unmuted, but the microphone doesn't show volume the way the other ones do. So it, okay. it, it may be the same I'm problem my, that Sherry has. Yeah. Had. Okay. Hmm. On my side of the screen, it does show the microphone's muted, but it goes back and forth. Uh, okay. Well, um, let's go to our next speaker. Okay. Um, Janice Anderson. And just if I could quickly say, um, there is a way to just call in on the phone right. if you're having technical difficulties. And if you look at the top of the agenda, the phone number's there with a code to call in, and then you press star nine to raise your hand. So if you want to use that option, uh, please try that. All right, good evening, Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Um, I wanna thank uh, Interim Chief Ben for his update. However, I have several issues I was hoping would be addressed tonight. First, the lack of response about community concerns about possible police support for the Capitol insurrection. Many of us have asked the officer's social media presence be investigated. I myself have seen some troubling posts from a former officer, almost obsessively critical, critical of BLM and supportive of the Breonna Taylor murder, and also saying it's okay for p police to shoot unarmed people. All of these things are within his First Amendment rights, but if that person was in charge of training younger officers working now, what kind of environment is being fostered there? This isn't an HR issue, this is a public safety issue. APD itself follows a troubling account which is supportive of the insurrectionists, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and COVID denial misinformation. In addition to the concerns surrounding the Capitol insurrection, I'm really dismayed at the handling of communication, especially after the gunman threatened a car caravan. That person is still at large, and as I understand, there has been very little communication with the community or the people he threatened about the pending investigation or if that is even ongoing. I was incredibly disappointed to learn that our homeless liaison is someone who shows up with a gun wearing a bulletproof vest. The officer may be a very fine person, but carrying a gun to engage our most vulnerable citizens is not the way I'd like to see things done. I'm really glad to hear the department clarify items about staffing and crime rates, since social media is always a buzz about these things. Hopefully some very vocal neighbors are here and taking notes. Lastly, it's really telling that departments all over the country are having a difficult time hiring new officers now that the conversation is about holding them accountable for their actions, which I hope we someday actually do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson, our next speaker. Um, we have, uh, maybe Alexia called in because we have a, a phone number now. So we're gonna try and promote um, that phone number um, and see if that's Alexia being able to speak. Okay, good evening. You're Hi, this is, yeah. Hi. Hi, this is Alexia Rocha. I'm so sorry about that. No worries, um, I got you. I was unmuting and it wasn't working, but that's okay. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for your time and for the updates. I am speaking from personal experience as an Alamedan, a Latina, a social justice lawyer, and also a domestic violence survivor. More cops do not solve the issues of this island. It's not going to solve the catalytic converter theft problem. More cops aren't going to magically appear during home invasions, and they won't deter isolated violent crimes. 
the fact that 29% of folks arrested last year identified as transient is staggering. I'm not sure how that statistic followed the statement that homelessness isn't a crime here. More statistics that were ignored have to do with race. In Alameda from 2018 to 2019, Black and Latinx folks made up 19.1% of Alameda's population, but they accounted for 53.7% of the arrests. And this is from APD's own data. Alameda has a very poor reputation of being quite racist, and the police department is no different. It's understandable since policing from its inception has racist roots. And we just witnessed this a couple weeks ago with the white man waving the gun around. Further concerning is the fact that it's been reported online that there were actually APD officers there um, in plain clothes, but they didn't identify themselves. So if we started shifting funds to other resources, making housing, healthcare, and education accessible, we wouldn't need so many cops. There are multiple reports and professionals that can easily explain it's not more cops that create more safety, but it's what cops do with their time that matters, or preferably less cops to no cops and more resources. Cities around the country are slashing their funds and rerouting that money. It's possible and would be entirely able to implement in a city our size. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Anderson, or Ms. A.B., sorry. Uh, our next speaker? Uh, Megan Livernach? Uh, Megan Livernach. Good evening, Ms. Livernach. Oh, yeah. good evening. Can mm -hmm. everyone hear me? We can. Hi. Um, so obviously, um, I'm familiar with a lot of you folks. Uh, good, good evening, Mayor. Um, you know, I'm speaking as a business owner here in uh, Alameda since two thir 2013. Um, I'm also speaking as a violent crime victim of a felony battery just 15 to 20 steps away from where the most recent Park Street shooting happened. And um, you know, I, I will say that coming from, you know, moving into Alameda in 2013, I've seen a marked decline in um, the quality of life, um, you know, watching your back, turning around to see who's, you know, who's following you and, and for, for good reason. You know, um, I think that we've heard the statistics that they say two, two point something percent down in 2020, but up 19 percent um, for violent crime, I think it was in 2019. So the, at the end of the day, that's not it's not a good record. Um, I know that there are valid reasons to take very solid look at police practices, um, but I know that the narrative is often sometimes summarized as we don't, we want the police to have less power. And um, I think that there's a gray area here between the social pressures and the real life that we wake up to every day, especially as small business owners. Um, solutions that I've read um, in the preliminary steering committee, you know, such as the intoxicated person passed out should be, you know, referred to supporting services. Ultimately, that's correct, that's true, that's ethical, but the gray area a lot of the time is where the local and small businesses get, get stuck holding the bag because what do we do with the intoxicated man that's laying in your business doorway that's been aggressive to you many, many times over? Um, you know, reports like that, like taking more power away from the police, um, I think that if they're carried away by larger social narrative and, and not looked at in a, in a, through a tighter lens um, can be dangerous because, you know, I don't always think that carrying a gun as a homeless liaison seems, appropriate, seems inappropriate. Sometimes I think that um, we have to show power across the board. Thank you, Ms. Livernoche. Our next speaker. Arlie Statham Lee. Go ahead, I'm not sure I heard that, but. Ah. Arlie. Yes, good evening. Good evening, can you hear me? I can. Good evening, City Council, Mayor, City Manager, and Chief Fenn. Um, I'm calling and very concerned that there is a racist and anti-Black Lives Matter culture at APD. I have also come across a series of shocking tweets by a former APD captain who only retired this past summer and whose Twitter account is followed by the APD Twitter account and the police chiefs. And his tweets show a complete lack of respect for BLM protesters. In one tweet, he called BLM supporters completely ignorant or criminal, and that was while he was still on the force, and in another commenting on what BLM protests are about, and he said the problem is not law enforcement, it is clearly the lack of discipline and accountability in Black America. And his tweets also show he devalues the lives of victims of fatal police shootings, variously tweeting about victims. He wanted to live the thug life, well, that's what happens, and good job, or calling the victim a POS loser, calling Brianna Taylor a nothing loser. And then another tweet said, individuals who were shot created that situation. And many, if not all, have proven they are horrible individuals with extensive criminal history. 
So those were his tweets, um, not my words. And while I realize this captain is no longer with the APD, again, I'd like to point out he was a captain until this past summer, meaning he commanded an entire police department bureau and was right below the chief of police in the order of command. So he had a lot of influence in setting the culture at APD and in training officers below him. From what I've seen, this is a public safety issue. And as such, I believe the city council or city manager should order an independent investigation of the APD to see how widespread these racist and anti-BLM attitudes are within the department. I can guarantee that he's not the only one, um, an APD who has such an attitude. And if this is the attitude, they shouldn't be allowed to go out to police BLM protests in Oakland, send out their tank to protest. Um, and I'm worried about the possibility that they might use excessive force or shoot a suspect here in Alameda if they have attitudes Thank like that. Thank you. Your time is up. Our next speaker. Matt Reed. Good evening, Mr. Reed. Hello there. Uh, hi there. That was actually three unmutes. Uh, thanks for the time, Council, and thanks for the visit, uh, uh, Chief, Interim Chief, and Captains. Uh, I want to first thank Alameda Police for doing a great job. Uh, I am concerned that the feedback you get is a little bit distorted and one-sided. We don't, not a lot of us have a lot of visibility into the machinations of the committees that have been appointed to advise you. Uh, but regardless, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, I'm a huge advocate of license plate readers. There's plenty of jurisdictions within 10 miles that do this and they have a high success rate. It's, uh, to me, it's a no brainer. I, I hope you guys can see that through. I think it would help you do your job. Number two, uh, I noted that the reduction in traffic cops, uh, you know, has, has led to a reduction in, in citations being issued. Uh, I'm a strong subscriber to the broken windows theory, which is if you prosecute the small crimes aggressively, it'll help prevent the big crimes. I think the interim chief, you were trying to make that point earlier. I think that's been demonstrated systematically over time in many different jurisdictions across the United States. So I encourage you to give us more tickets. Uh, I'm very proud of the two tickets I got in my wife's 72 VW Beetle, one on Otis, one on Ensenal. I should have known better. Uh, and it taught me a lesson. I need to drive slower. So I encourage you to, to try and beef up staff there. And it kind of breaks my heart to think that what's getting in the way of your staffing is waiting for recommendations from these committees. Uh, lastly, I would love to, to hear about uh, some initiative where you incentivize police to live locally. Uh, I think that uh, other jurisdictions, Baltimore comes to mind, are trying to do this. Uh, I think police who live in the community uh, will, will inherently build more trust with that community. Perhaps there's a financial incentive that could be provided. I'm not sure, but I would love to see Alameda officers at Trader Joe's and Safeway uh, around town. I think it would actually do a whole lot. Um, and that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Our next speaker. Laura Catrona. Good evening, Ms. Catrona. Good evening. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you, Mayor, Council, and um, Chief Ben for coming in to offer a report this evening. I had there was one thing that you mentioned that stuck with me, Chief Ben, which was keep guns from folks who shouldn't have them. Um, a, a lot of other callers have echoed this, but I'm deeply concerned about the lack of response from APD re releasing information around officers or folks who are an APD staff who may have been involved with the insurrection at the Capitol um, and the MLK peaceful protest um, gunmen and aren't like the, the response to that. Um, those are acts of domestic terrorism. And, you know, even if they're within the force, like I think it's really imperative that we ask ourselves questions around, do we have a double standard of who, who are the folks who have access to the weapons um, we should be keeping guns from folks who shouldn't have them, um, whether they're on the force or not. If they're, if they're um, domestic terrorists, if they're going to the Capitol, if they're supporting white supremacist causes, like to me, that's absolutely a public safety concern. And so I would just point that question back to you and, and think, about, think about that. So um, thank you all for your time and I appreciate, I appreciate the update. Thank you, Ms. Katrina. Our next speaker? Josh uh, Geyer. Good evening, Mr. Geyer. Where is he? Um, we lost him. We'll yeah. try Michael Murphy and hopefully Josh can come back. Oh, uh, there he is again, but we'll go to Michael Murphy. There he is. Okay, good evening, Mr. Murphy. Go ahead, oh, yeah. Hi, I'm here. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay, excellent. Thank you for uh, letting me speak and thank you for all for being here. 
um, I'm definitely an advocate for the LPR. Um, I just want to share something real quick about me living here in Alameda, second generation. I've loved this island since I was born. It's a beautiful place to be. It's a great place to grow up. And I would like to see it continue that way, but it's heading in the wrong direction. Uh, my wife was almost shot on Park Street during the last shooting. Last week, we had someone sitting in front of our house for five hours, scoping it out. And there's nothing that can be done. It's not heading in the right direction. If they have a license plate reader, at least they can see this kind of stuff. It's important. Like even with a license plate number, there's nothing anybody can do. That's, I have a kid, I have a wife and a family. I don't wanna lose them. When we go shopping, South Shore, anywhere on the island, we see people walking out of the store, robbing it in broad daylight and no one's doing anything and saying anything. Um, you know, with the, the crime that's happening here in Alameda, what are the statistics that how many of the locals are causing this crime and who's coming here from other places and causing these crimes? How do we know that? Are we just prey from other, other cities? Because we're easy. Alameda is, is easy pickings for a lot of people. Um, and that's really kind of unfortunate and crimes will probably still continue. I believe we need a lot more police enforcement, especially with more housing. There needs to be a lot more money allocated to the police department. Training and everything else and, and, and having investigators, you can go only in a positive direction with more policing. So please consider it. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. And who do we have next? Then? We'll, we'll try Josh uh, Geyer again. Oh, okay, right, there he is. Hi, uh, thank you, um, Council uh, Mayor. Uh, that was a lot that just happened. Um, my head's spinning a little bit. Um, so racist attitudes, comments, actions uh, on by police officers are inexcusable, period. We're, we know we have a, a problem in this country, in the city with police racism. Any hint of it should be investigated and then it should not be waved off. It's, it's a problem and we should treat it like one. Um, to the business owner who said she moved in into Alameda in 2013, the quality of life has gone down. I also moved here in 2013. I have two small children with whom I walk all the time at all, all hours of the day. It, it seems like there's there's like this, some people, uh, including the last three commenters or so, uh, feel that the quality of life in Alameda is continuously in decline. And and it, it makes me wonder, like if it's continuously declining and declining, how, how is it not like a total slum? Like if, if it's always going down in one direction, I, I would posit that th these assertions about quality of life going down, about crime increasing, are based on people's personal experiences and anecdotes, but they run counter to all of the data that we have about crime, about what's going on. Um, there was a mention of outsiders coming in. That is a racist trope. Please, please do not say that anymore. Um, housing, bringing housing doesn't automatically bring more crime. You don't have to, to staff up the police department just because you add a couple more housing units. Um, broken, broken windows policing is, is uh, there is no evidence to, to show that that is preventative. There's much, much, much reams of evidence uh, showing that it is discriminatory and there are disparate impacts on, on people of color. It is a horrible idea. We shouldn't duplicate what has already been proven to be um, hugely discriminatory and damaging to, to um, black and brown people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Geyer. Our next speaker. Jay Garfinkel. Good evening, Mr. Garfinkel. Good evening. I'd like to thank the police chief for uh, sharing all of that uh, very interesting data. Um, I have a concern about the license plate readers and uh, having an outside agency evaluate uh, our data. Uh, I'm not convinced that having license plate readers will do anything to deter crime, though some people may feel more comfortable if we have it. Um, in, either, in both of those situations, license plate readers and outside evaluation, my concern is that there be adequate steps taken to uh, prevent abuse by uh, police officers and other agencies. And I mentioned police officers only because it has been reported that that happens 
And I believe even in Oakland that there have been cases where officers uh, abuse their access to the data. Uh, I've, I'm surprised that that happens, but I just want to make sure we have something in place to prevent that. Also, I want to make sure that uh, whatever agencies provide these services uh, and evaluate the data, uh, I want to make sure that uh, personal identif personally identifiable information uh, is protected and that we're not giving away too much personal information uh, to obtain these services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garfinkel. Our next speaker. That was our last speaker. We're that was done with public speaker. comment. Okay, so I'm now closing public comment on this item and we go back to the council. So, um, you know, Madam Vice Mayor, I think that you actually still had the floor when we had to take our vote and then I asked if we could go on to the public speakers. So I will um, cede the floor back over to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I I, I do want to, uh, actually some of my follow-up questions uh, were, were raised by some of the public speakers. I do, uh, and I have talked to the city manager, so these aren't, these aren't new questions, but I, I do want to um, ask our, our chief Ben uh, to uh, perhaps uh, give some follow-up on uh, the investigation relative to uh, the individual who uh, was, uh, armed and at the um, the MLK Day uh, event. Uh, if you could, please, Chief Ben. Sure, absolutely. Um, we are still looking for help from the public. Uh, we have not identified uh, who that person is yet, but that does not mean the investigation is not ongoing. Um, and so anybody who uh, has information uh, or can help us in this investigation, we will absolutely, we, we urge you to call and uh, we need your help. Um, it, is, it is just wrong to say that, uh, that we have not taken it seriously. We took it seriously from the second we got the, the phone call, sent all the resources available at that time um, that were working to the scene. Um, tactically, how we handled it at that time is, uh, is a matter that we've been discussing internally in the police department to learn from. Um, I think anytime you are dealing with uh, large groups of people, um, we understand the call for uh, uh, de-escalation and restraint and those things. So it is a balancing act. And I believe that was uh, the intent of those who responded. But the, the fact of the matter is uh, none of us want to see anyone get away with uh, the behavior that we've seen uh, from this individual and uh, we very much want to bring him to justice and urge again anybody to um, who may have information to please contact the Alameda Police Department so we can do just that. Uh, and Chief Fent, sorry go ahead Madam Mayor. I, I was just going to ask a follow-up question to the Vice Mayor's question which is with the benefit of 2020 hindsight if God forbid a similar incident were to occur again, would you do anything differently? I think that's again, part of the internal conversation. I, I think um, if, if officers rush in, is there a possibility that they uh, cause a shooting to happen? It's possible. Um, I think that's why we, we have discussed this incident. Um, because we didn't have an act of violence happen because we did an ultimate act of violence. I understand him showing up with the gun was absolutely an act of violence, but because it didn't escalate to a shooting, no one was injured. Um, is it possible that, that it was handled properly by the officers who responded? I think you could make that argument, but again, could we also make the argument that um, the next time it happens, should we, should we rush right in? Those are the things that we have to, those are the split second decisions that you're, uh, that you want your police officers to make, especially the, the supervisors and the managers. And so we try to learn from those things and, and, and make good decisions going forward. So uh, I'm with you, God forbid it happens again, Madam Mayor. And, and I, I understand that there's an internal discussion about it and I might imagine that, that there are more than two possible um, courses of action in something so complex. But one thing I would say, and then I'll go back to the vice mayor, but 
Um, sometimes the communication around an incident is almost as important as what transpired. And so in this particular case, it happened on a Monday because it was um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. It was a holiday. And um, we didn't see a press release until the following evening. I know because it came out during a council meeting. Uh, so I didn't have a chance to read it till much later that evening. But um, I, I would just uh, suggest or, or offer that um, communication in real time, and especially these days when everyone's on social media um, is, is, um, is, is important. Um, so Vice Mayor Vela, back to you. I was just going to say I, I would appreciate um, and I, I do appreciate the updates that the council gets. Um, I, I do think that that this is uh, one of those incidents that is higher profile um, and I, I think continued communication um, uh, with the community is also appreciated um, and I think would be helpful. It's uh, I think sometimes it's it's uh, there's a perception that work is not being done um, unless we show that we are doing work. Um, that goes for the council as much as it goes for um, other city departments. And so, you know, I think um, allowing there to be an absence of, of information uh, or statements about ongoing investigations causes uh, this confusion and also um, distrust. And so I would just encourage you, and I know that there's obviously uh, some internal communications going on and conversations um, but, but to the extent possible to continue to uh, address that issue publicly if there are any updates um, or, or things like that. I, I think there is a, uh, also a concern about the use or, or if we had plainclothes officers there uh, or if they were from the district attorney's office. I know that there's been conflicting information uh, to the extent that we can clarify things. Um, maybe not now, but moving forward, I think that that would also be appreciated. Um, when, when, when the opportunity, uh, you know, when, when we can, um, I think that there, there is a concern, uh, and that has been raised also around the, the capital insurrection. Um, my understanding is that, uh, and if the city manager could, um, speak on it, these were questions I think that the community's raised and I know council has raised, um, but if the city manager could, could also comment on that, that would be helpful. Mr. Levitt. You have to I, yeah. I know. So, <laughs> um, last words. And I, and so I responded to several people that wrote at the at the time. We are. I've a, I asked the chief and the captains to to look into it and see if there was any um, social media. We we are not aware of anyone that was there within the APD. They did look at it. We haven't found any support from current officers. There was some discussion of former officers who are retired or, or have left, but no one of current officers. I will say that when they are investigating it, um, if they see something of an officer or some, uh, on, on the insurrection, that the issue there is you have freedom of speech, but at the same time on an insurrection, that as a law enforcement officer, you cannot be promoting um, criminal activity. And so um, in looking at it though, in an investigation or personnel investigation, it would have to be confidential. There are certain state laws that require a confidentiality. So I did ask them to, to look at it. They have reported back to me on what they have found or not found. And we do encourage people, again, we encourage people if they know of someone that's a current police officer or currently in the department that has promoted that, that they, they reach out to us so that we can investigate it further. But we have done initial looks um, and I can't report back on that because it is a personnel matter. My follow-up question is, um, there have been tweets referenced uh, from a former APD uh, 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 captain. Um, are we, or have, has that been looked into in terms of incident, you know, if there were incidents related to uh, while that individual was on duty or, or um, whether they were a training officer. I, I understand that, that every department does it differently. Uh, just because you're in command staff doesn't mean that you're necessarily in charge of training, but are we looking into those concerns? 
So, I'll let the city manager take that one too, please. So those concerns, and there are concerns I heard tonight that I had not heard before, and those concerns will be looked into, and if they have not already been looked into. And uh, city manager Levitt, uh, would you be the person to contact uh, if if uh, community members have uh, believe that they ha have stumbled upon things that are cause for concern or that they would like looked into potentially? I, I would encourage you either contact myself or interim chief Fenn, um, either one of us, and then if he he's contacted, he would inform me that he's been contacted. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that that there. Uh, I think part of the reason for the request for data and and making sense of it is um, raw numbers without context um, can lead to a number of different conclusions. Um, that's a concern that I have, and I think how we define um, the different things uh, matters. Uh, the context in which they occur matters. Um, who's involved? Uh, all of these different things. Um, you know, I, I am concerned by by the, the the different ratios in terms of uh, who's been stopped historically in in Alameda. It's not to say that um, that that's definitive data, but I do think that getting more clarity on on what our our trends have looked like and and what the data means would be helpful for all of us um, in, in making these decisions. Um, I, I also really want to speak to um, the the violent crimes issue and, and the uh, the underlying issues. And um, Chief and I, I appreciated you distinguishing between the, the domestic violence occurrences and some of the other occurrences and the fact that there might be different tactics involved. Um, you know, I, I do have a concern about um, the, the lack of housing, transitional housing, um, the impact of the COVID nineteen pandemic because. It's not just the city of Alameda. My understanding is that some of these trends are national and regional, and it's about compounding um, stresses uh, and, and tolls that have been taken on uh, members of the public because of economic insecurity, uh, housing insecurity, a number of different things. Um, so it's it's kind of the compounding of all of that. Um, so I, I one thing that I do want to put out there is not to say that 2020 is an anomaly, but 2020 is an anomaly. And how do we account for that when we also look at the data um, so that we're not just responding to um, one year that was particularly bad, but we're looking at all of the underlying issues and we're looking at the overall trends uh, relative to data. And so when we do have data and we have that conversation, that's something that I would like to look into. So I, I thank you all for your time tonight and for um, uh, all of the, uh, the openness in terms of responding to the questions. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, so I'm going to go, I, I just have a few um, questions, really. Um, I, and I um, thank you all for, um, for being here and, and um, uh, listening to questions and comments and, um, uh, and, and doing your best to answer us. So um, this is uh, kind of a broad uh, based question, but what would you like the public, including the city council, to know that maybe our questions haven't gotten to yet? I can only imagine the challenge it must be to do your job at this particular moment in time with so much going on around you involving some of your own profession, what, you know, help us understand better from your perspective, because it's related to my next question. Um, I understand that there is um, a search underway for a new uh, police chief in Alameda, and there's certain criteria that um, certainly the police subcommittees would like to see. I think the council certainly has ideas um, and the, the city manager will make the ultimate decision and we also do want and need to hire more officers, officers with the kinds of skills for policing in the 21st century. So how do we attract and hire and retain those kinds of good officers right up to the chief while working in this um, very challenging environment? There's a simple question for you. Who wants to jump to answer that? I'll take a I'll take a crack at it. You're the chief. You start, please. Thank you. 
I, I, I think going to your first question of what I would want the you folks uh, as the council and the public to know is that uh, when I got here again, just, just back in October, I found a, um, a good group of employees here, um, a group of uh, community minded folks who are very service oriented. And um, I feel very confident in saying that um, having worked for a number of police departments over the course of my career, are we perfect? No, when you find the perfect police department, please let me know, I'll, I'll apply. And then I'll make it imperfect by by being there, um, and so I, I think they I think they want um, they want the community to know that they care about their job, they care about what they do. Uh, they've had a really rough year. Um, I don't like to play uh, any type of victim card, and I don't think I, and I won't play it on their behalf. But I can tell you that it's been a tough year on them as well, and. Um, I think, and this is where the two questions start to connect. They're looking for some stability and understanding going forward. What does the community of Alameda want from its police department going forward? What can they expect from this work environment going forward? And so um, I think that's going to be key, not only to retaining the folks you have, but attracting new people as well. So what can they expect um, going forward, what does it mean to be an Alameda police officer again, 2021 and going forward? And that's where, of course, the big question is uh, the steering committees and, the, and those reports. Um, but it's also going to be balanced by uh, residents and, and or I, I believe it should be balanced by residents and by business owners. And there's a lot of constituents here. And so the cops, frankly, feel like they're kind of in the middle. And so the calls keep coming in, the 911 calls keep coming. Um, and what is it that they want me to do? Uh, and so I think the more clarity we have uh, going forward, the more we can work together going forward. That's the downside and the disappointment of the pandemic is that again, the face-to-face -face interaction that we would expect to have with the community, with the neighbors, with the business owners, uh, we're missing that important component. And the, and the sooner we can get back to that, I think will help bring clarity for both the public, the community, as well as the police. And I hope that helps to start answer that question. Thank you, Chief Finn. It does help. And, and you um, reminded me that there was something I wanted to share that, um, yes, we, um, on March 16th, city council meeting, this council will consider the recommendations of the uh, five different police subcommittees. But before that time, we wanna hear from you because we wanna hear from as many members of the public, our residents, our business owners. And so there is a, um, a survey that is being mailed to all households because we wanna make sure that we're bridging the digital divide. Not everyone is going to be um, comfortable or even capable of going online and taking a survey. So look for that. Um, by mail survey in your mailbox soon. Um, you will want to complete it and return it by um, February 21st. So um, you can also complete the online survey at www.alamedaca.gov forward slash policing survey all run together. So um, your input and that of the subcommittees um, will, will help um, us, the city council, make an informed decision. So, um, uh, council member Desaga, maybe I heard, um, heard, <laughs> I heard your hands. Um, I, we, I'll just remind everybody, it's 11:43. We've got, you know, up to 11:59. So you just talk as long or as short as you'd like to, and we'll see how far we go. And um, so, council member Desaga, you got your hand up. You go. I'll try to talk quick. Um, first and foremost, you know, I want to make, uh, I would love to have the acting uh, chief of police to make sure to extend um, the gratitude of the city council um, for the work um, that the men and women um, in the Alameda Police Department do, especially in these trying times um, where there are issues of national concern that we're, we're figuring out locally um, uh, and, and uh, cutting across that are real life um, increases in certain kinds of crime. Crime, violence crime in particular. So I know these are most especially difficult times in terms of, you know, the day-to-day -day operations and wondering what your expectations are. So, so let me just 
briefly indicate, you know, from what, what I see as, as certain um, uh, key issues. One is, um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm un unabashedly um, going to say that I want to see us work towards 88. I, I think that's the number that we have um, uh, to go after. And the, 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 the temporary lull at 73, as I recall, that was supposed to be until October 2020. But, um, but so I don't really recall that being kind of a, a, a tempor uh, temporary, you know, beyond um, October 2020. I might be misremembering mis things. So, so I am, uh, I do want to three, see um, uh, uh, some kind of um, ac um, um, uh, strategy towards 88. Um, sworn officers. Um, as we uh, look to modify our police um, in terms of, you know, its culture and all that, my, my, my one overarching step is that whatever modifications that, that we contemplate, I would hope that it works off of, builds off of um, institutions and protocols and procedures that we have in place. For example, we have um, within our manual a, a chapter on standards of conduct, which, by the way, identifies elements that would capture uh, issues regarding, you know, how people tweet uh, about this or that issue. It's in there. Does it have to be um, modified and improved? Okay, let's see that. But make those modifications within the context of our existing procedures and policies. Because um, I think if you do, if we if we proceed in modernizing our police force from what what is working right now, um, that will give uh, some form of stability to our officers as to they, they could. It's something. It's a basis uh, for them to work off of. So those are two items that, that I would love to um, see generally, you know, an active plan towards 88. And then if there are to be any um, modifications with it, with our police culture, that it works off of the existing structures and policies that we have in place, um, as opposed to just kind of dropping this thing in from something that works because of a Washington DC think tank says so, pejoratively speaking. Um, so those are, I'm just gonna limit it to those two items. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Desa. Councilmember Herrera Spencer, did I see your hand up? Okay, when we're mute, and I think we're golden. There you go. Very good. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, so thank you. Um, and I want to thank the public comments because uh, they're all over, right? So when I hear the chief saying, you know, feeling stuck in the middle, um, you're in a divided community, right? You're hearing it from all sides. And I'm gonna tell you, you also, as you know, have a split council. I was not on council when they gave direction to the city manager to um, come up with this uh, subcommittee and steering committee who then chose the subcommittee, but that was not uh, what I would call a public process. And that normally all of our commissions and committees, the public applies is a public process of whether it be the mayor or a commission that then chooses. So I actually want to make clear that this is in fact the city manager's uh, steering committee and subcommittees is not councils uh, because council, that's my understanding of how this came down that the city manager then chose who's on it. And I do not think it is uh, sadly, I would say, you know, so to me, that is a concern. Um, moving forward, I think that is just one group of people that we've heard from. However, I think these other comments from people that may or may not be on the commissions, on the, on the city managers committees, I think their input is as valuable because uh, this was the, the subcommittees have not had Brown Act notice meetings. We got to observe you all. Thank you for taking the questions. We, the public, were not allowed to submit questions. It was only from this the subcommittees. And I think that's very important because then we hear from the members of our public at large and where are they? Well, okay, so we have had an armed home invasion recently and you all know that. And the response time, what are we doing? And this is actually not, and I actually I'm happy to have you ask this answer, but in regards to when we have uh, our minimum of so many officers is like a very, very low number. Uh, three officers and one sergeant is what the minimum could be when we're having an armed home invasion, right? Gun, a gun, right? I have had multiple people come up and talk to me about this um, guns, uh, at least one gun being fired inside a home. 
uh, this obviously is a very serious problem. And I think in the armed robberies, when I see robberies of 19%, and I actually don't know if that's all armed, but we, at least I know people that have, you may call it anecdotal and that I wasn't there, but they go to the ATM, they get followed and there's a gun. They're walking down the street uh, carrying a cell phone and there's a gun. Um, but in regards to your ability, the officers, to respond timely to try to um, you know, address the crime, uh, I'm actually going to be looking to law enforcement to hear from you all too, not, and in fact, the, commi the commission, the committee, the city managers, committee members always say the majority of them are not in law enforcement, as in they are not trained in law enforcement. Uh, I'm not trained in law enforcement, so it is in fact you all that I will be looking to, to, and I'm happy to have you here, the community members, and that's what you are trained to do, but at some point I do hope to hear your response in regards to, and honestly I think waiting until mid-March to hear what are our, what's happening to APD, what is happening to APD, and that is a problem. I hear it all the time. I don't want to be a victim of uh, ho armed home invasion. I th do think it's serious and a 19% increase and in the increase in the murders, th that's what the data said, I believe. Uh, so, I, so I am looking to all of you in regards to, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and I hope that you all do recognize that. Uh, so I actually don't know the number because maybe there are some things that we could hand off to some other department, to some other people, so that maybe we don't need the 88, I don't know. I do know though, when a call comes in that we're having an armed home invasion, that hopefully we have officers that are able to respond in a very timely manner. And I think that is actually like, you know, so I'm not, I am not, an, uh, I am interested in seeing them. Well, Maybe there is another way to do it, but at the same time, I don't want to compromise that we don't have a response or we have a late response uh, to right to, to someone carrying a gun. But, but in regards to the incident on, M on MLK Day, I think that that is interesting because I don't know whether or not there were undercover officers there. However, I would in fact be concerned for our officer's safety. Uh, if you all had shown up in, uh, and I, I'm, you know, in the uniforms uh, during this protest, uh, the reality is we are living in 2021 now. You know, you 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 do have to figure out a way to protect yourselves as well as our community, and it's a very heavy lift. Um, so I I am looking for feedback. And honestly, I actually don't necessarily need feedback as much as I just need to make sure that you all have the tools you need to make to do responsible policing. So thank you for your service to our community. Thank you, Councilmember Herrera Spencer. Councilmember Knox White. Thank you. So I, I had a couple of comments, but but uh, I just heard a council member suggest that the police department has not uh, re did not respond to a home invasion appropriately and is sitting around waiting to make any changes to the way. And, and I'd just like to hear from the police chief since the chief is here to talk to us and talk to about it, to talk about that incident. I, and I haven't spoken to you, but uh, was there an incident uh, in uh, about staffing that I-, I Okay, I, I just, um, I, Councilor okay. Harris Spencer, I'm not sure that I'm that's sorry. what I heard you said. Uh, that's okay. not what I said. And I'm really disappointed to have a council member attack me like that and misrepresent my comments. So let me that stop you. What I said. Let me Thank stop you. you both. What I would just like you to do then is clarify for us what yeah, you did say, Ms. Okay. Ms. Herrera Spencer. Just clarify for us because I I didn't think I heard you say that either. No, that's not what I said. I said so, that I well. So um, I'm happy to uh, try to repeat. However, I did say quite a bit. Uh, that my understanding is that there was there are multiple incidents. However, it doesn't have to be just that one where it, um, the response time from APD uh, may not be uh, what um, it may, you may, you may, and I don't, so I actually don't need to, uh, I, I did not suggest, and I hope I didn't suggest that you all are not, uh, well, actually I'm, I'm sure you're responding to the best of your abilities. <laughs> 
I think we may have a problem that with not having enough officers or not being able to um, yeah, respond in a timely manner. And that's unfortunate, but when you only have, right, I don't want to take all this time, but, but you misrepresent, I do want to get back to council member Knox, right? You misrepresented my statements. Thank you. I apologize. I guess when I, I, just to clarify, when I hear you say that they weren't able to respond in a timely manner and that they are waiting until March to hear from the committees before making changes that could fix that, 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 that that's what I heard. So I apologize. It wasn't meant as an attack, but I, 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 if I would like to hear what the police, I would like to hear the police's response about that. What I, what I just heard is we're not responding fast enough. I have not heard that from the police department yet. And I ask questions all the time. And I would like to understand, because I think we've asked a number of times tonight, if there are things related to violent crime that we should be doing now, we've asked, what should we be doing and not heard that? So tonight is, as far as I'm sure, con it's, but I'm, I'm confident that tonight was supposed to be the night for that conversation. Thank you. So to the question posed by um, council member Knox White, would you like to respond? Chief Finn, and for the rest of the council, well, <laughs> Chief Finn, we haven't added you to the council yet. I just wanted to a uh, little reality check. It is 11.55, but uh, Chief Finn. Uh, uh, hopefully I'm, ad I'm addressing. So the, the question with regard to response time and those things, yes, those are those are things we look at all the time. We, we pride ourselves. My understanding is this police department in particular has prided itself for a long time of having very quick response times. Um, and of course, the, the, we run the risk of those things suffering because of reduced staffing, right? That's just, uh, I think everybody can understand that. I have not heard a specific complaint yet about a violent crime or a priority one call where we have had an unreasonable delay in responding. And I hope and pray that we don't get to that point. And we've talked internally about what are the things we need to do if we are to a point where the demand outweighs the ability to deliver the service at a particular moment, especially with uh, priority and violent crimes and how we might have to, uh, like the fire department does, tap into regional resources, neighboring agencies to help us out. So um, yes, the more officers on the street, of course, we can respond to more things and, and get there faster. But um, I have not heard a specific complaint about anything we have not responded to in a, in a reasonably timely manner. Thank you. Thank you all um, for your, your time. Um, Chief Fan, um, thank you so much. Captain Emmett, Captain McMullen, um, we appreciate you um, sharing your, um, your experience and your wisdom with us. Yes, Councilmember Knox White, you're muted. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, I, I still had a quick some quick comments in the last minute and a half, if I could. Sure. And let me just, uh, I was going to try and appoint our new transportation commissioner, which I could do in like 30 seconds if we have that left. But you go ahead and talk for as long as you want. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll send the city manager, I, I guess. Go ahead. You've got a little time and we've got a little time. Well, and so I, I just want to say I, you know, I, I'm interested if you, if the, if the officer, if the department wants to bring back a discussion on li license plate readers, I'm interested in having that conversation. But I will expect that it, uh, it includes information about proven effectiveness because the, the when, while we hear about uh, neighboring uh, neighboring cities that have put this in, most of those cities actually saw increases in theft, increases in insults, increases in robbery. Um, after they installed those license plate readers. There, there is, as far as I can find, no real good, well-documented uh, effectiveness studies uh, on license plate readers in the state of California. Um, so I, I would like to have that conversation. I, there are people I'm sure who can find that information. If you wanna share it, I, I keep asking for it. So, um, but just for the community, I, I think we can have that, that, that discussion, but we need to, we need to deal in the, in the data. Um, uh, I will still be looking for from the city manager an ETA on getting the, the traffic uh, analysis in the in the next couple of months. I, I feel that we are at a point where we need this information to, to guide our, our our conversations moving forward. And then, and then lastly, um, just as, as I try to quickly wrap up, um, uh, you know, I, I really appreciated the, the chief. You know, highlighted we had four people killed by cars last year. We had 143 people injured by cars last year. Um, when we talk about public safety, uh, we, we did have three murders. 
Um, those were not random incidents where people were randomly uh, uh, injured by people they did not know as, as uh, the traffic violence tends to happen. And I wanna make sure that we are, as we're looking to put our resources out there and into place and, and protect the community, um, uh, given that we have had a conversation tonight where we've identified it's very difficult to pre-stop uh, the violent crimes, the gun crimes, which are, are horrific and whatnot, uh, you know, and we're putting efforts to capture the people who have done that. I, I want to make sure that, that this conversation doesn't lose sight of the fact that the greatest harm that is happening to people in our community is actually coming not from uh, robberies and assaults. It's coming from the, the families who are having their, their children and their loved ones uh, uh, hit uh, by, by drivers. So um, just to, as a balancing on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to close this item and I'm going to skip to two that I didn't need to vote for because they're not um, action items um, and they are 10A and 10B. Uh, for 10A, I have one nomination that I want to introduce and then the council, the full council will vote on it um, at our next meeting. And that is to fill a vacancy on our transportation commission. My um, nomination is Randy Rentschler. He is an Alameda resident and a long time um, uh, senior official at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. You may recall uh, he recently came and spoke to us um, in one of our discussions about the housing element and um, ABAG and the, the uh, arena allocations. And, um, and then I'm also appointing a subcommittee um, to be our um, uh, my council committee to review city council meeting rules of order, and that is uh, council member John Knox White. And with that, the city clerk says our time is up. Good night, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Wear your masks. Vaccines are on the way. Good night. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>